Hello, my name is Aaron Shafawalaf. I'm here with Hannah Syriac. Now we already had a conversation together and uh, we had a terrible problem with uh, the shotgun mic picking up all the sounds of the street. So today I have this funny looking field mic that has a wind blocker and hopefully we can have the same essential conversation. I have the bullet points from the, exist from the previous conversation. Hopefully we can follow the flow of it. Um, but uh, we're here at, in Provo at the Provo City Center Temple at Center Street and uh, University Avenue. Uh, now, Hannah, you are a, a BYU student at a, in a master's program, classical yeah. studies? Yeah, so I'm studying Latin, Greek, and Biblical Hebrew. Excellent. Um, uh, so the first thing we talked about last time was, uh, was Heavenly Father once perhaps a sinful mortal? And the reason we started the conversation, or the, sort of the catalyst or the peak was, I had heard you give a position, not, not like present your own position on this point, but you had described a position that I had never heard before. So uh, what are some of the options or categories of thought that Latter-day Saints take to that in, in answering that question? Sure. So we believe that there are multiple different worlds, right? So we believe that there is a Heavenly Father and then Jesus Christ. And one position that you can take is that there are multiple different Heavenly Fathers and multiple different Saviors. So you could say that all these different Saviors were the firstborn and it follows a pattern. That's the more traditional Latter-day Saint approach. That's the approach that I take. But another approach that people take is that Jesus Christ is the Savior for all infinite number of worlds. So sort of, a, a, we, we fleshed this out last time, but um, in the second view you're describing, Jesus' atonement has a retroactive effect, it sounds like, um, atoning for the sins of his ancestors? Yes. So that's a position that people take. So Jesus Christ could have atoned for Heavenly Father's sins because it takes more of a B theory of time where basically there's an infinite time loop as opposed to linear time. So that would mean that anything that is actualized at one point was actualized at the point prior and at the point forward. So in the first view, um, and this is my language of articulation, trying to, trying to be clear, um, uh, in the first view, it sounds like there's a family tree of deities. Uh, now, uh, just just to be overt and uh, upfront, um, it it's all good. No worries. Uh, it's not a professional video. Uh, it, in the first, so um, it seems useful in this dialogue to just uh, cover a lot of material and mine it out and get clarity. And you're you seem to be uh, unique in that. Uh, uh, or uncommon, at least in the sense of being uh, super well thought out and very articulate. Very, um, that sounds condescending sometimes. No, no, You're very I, articulate. I, I mean, I'm 21, so like. uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, in the Latter Day Saint community, there's not a lot of theologians, not a lot of philosophers. So to meet somebody who loves to talk about the details of theology, at one level, that's very exciting because it's like, ah, uh, you know, we could we could flesh things out, hash things out. On another level, I'm I'm chomping at the bit to critique pretty much everything you're saying uh, forcefully. And you, you've seen me in other contexts sure, uh, debate and rebuke and ref yeah. refute. And I totally would. But in this context, we're just going to um, hash it out. Uh, it's not because I lack criticism. It, it's just it's different mode, different context. So Definitely, yeah. um, OK, so in the first view, it sounds like there is a genealogy of gods or family tree of gods and that uh, there are different branches of the family tree. And in that view, I'm just kind of rehashing again that yeah. the the savior of every branch is covering the immediate children of that branch. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So Heavenly Father has, uh, Heavenly Father with Heavenly Mother has had many different spirit children and they are on different worlds and that the savior covers the specific local, uh, local is kind of a weird term to use, but local area of Children. Earlier we called it uh, regional cosmic jurisdiction. Yeah, regional cosmic jurisdiction. Yeah, that's exactly how it is um, in the first view. So, um, uh, regarding the second view, it sounds like in this view, of course, Jesus is atoning for the sins of his own father. Yes, Jesus would have atoned for the sins of his own father in this view, yes, that is possible. Which you don't hold, but you've heard others to take? Yes, I've heard some people, definitely more progressive people, hold this view. Um, but I've heard it. Ta I've heard this take, um, and their view is that because we describe the atonement as infinite, then it must apply infinitely, um, is what I've heard as their justification. So the logic is it's without, uh, without boundaries, without limitation. Sure, yes. The scope is unlimited. It's not a limited atonement. It's an unlimited atonement. Okay. Um, 
in this first view, I guess in the second view too, is there a regression of gods? Is there an infinite ancestry of deities? Yes, there would be an infinite regression of gods in both views. But the infinite regression of gods is easier to understand in the first view because in the first view you're saying that all children of God have the potential to become like God, to inherit their divine nature, as it says in Timothy, you know, um, to be partakers of the divine nature. Whereas in the second view, then you're saying that there's more of a one-shot lineage where some people will choose not to be gods, even if they have the necessary grace given to them by Jesus Christ through the atonement to do that. Okay, so it sounds like in at least the first view, I have, I think I've heard this described uh, well, I know I've heard it described as a royal line of sinless saviors, but I know that the term hasn't really been yeah. the main term for it. In this view, as I understand it, uh, every heavenly father, heavenly family, has a, uh, a son, a firstborn son, sure. preeminent son, who takes the role of a sinless savior, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the, the question is, um, is there kind of like a premier pristine, special subset of the lineage. It's like the royal line of sinless saviors sure, where agree, yeah. certain people who are spirit children kind of lucked out because uh, they, not, not all of the exalted gods never sinned, but among this special subset of the lineage of the royal, the royal line of sinless yeah, saviors, yeah. some people luck out and they say, well, our Heavenly Father was a sinless Savior in a premortal probation, but maybe other exalted deities weren't or something like that. Sure, I see what you're getting at. Um, I would say, I'd be hesitant to say luck out because I think Jesus Christ's atonement was very difficult to perform. It was the most difficult and heart-wrenching act that anyone could perform. So I think there's that element to it. I would say that it's more an instance of foreordination where the firstborn son, because of the patterns of eternal law, is destined to have that. Um, and they can choose to not have that. But again, I think it's, I think choice within foreordination becomes limited because you're not going to choose against the will of the good if you can recognize good. So I'd say that it's more of a eternal pattern thing than it is like a lucking out thing. Just because the, the atonement would be very difficult to provide. I know how many times I've sinned and I would hate to have to suffer for my sins on my own merit. You know what I mean? So maybe the different lucking out is, um, it seems at least to an evangelical that it would be preferable to worship a God who never sinned than who ever sinned. And so some worshipers in the family tree of gods get the privilege of worshiping a God who never sinned, whereas others, I guess I'm sneaking in some criticism here. Yeah, that's fine. The others are like, oh, my heavenly father, maybe he was a sinner, but maybe, you know, he was perfected later. But I guess maybe that, that's where I should shift the luck out language to. Yeah, I see what you're saying there. Um, my response to that would be, I don't define who I worship based on whether or not they never sinned. That's not a necessary qualification for God. For me, the necessary qualification for God, the God that I worship, is one that has been made good, the one that, who is good. Um, so I, I, see the, I see the shifting ground that that has for evangelicals. Um, I just say that because God is good now, in my frame of earthly existence and even my frame of spiritual existence right because i believe that we are intelligences then spirit children then physical children god never sinned within my my spiritual or physical existence i've heard it verbalized as as far as we're concerned or as far as we can see back or as far as it pertains to us exactly. i had a friend who said uh heavenly father never sinned from all eternity and then later on he qualified it as well at least in this eternity maybe in a prior eternity he was a sinful mortal yes yes I think God was once a sinful mortal who was made perfect through an atonement. I don't think it was the atonement of Jesus Christ. I think it was the atonement of some other Christ, right? Because Christ just means anointed one. It's Christos. So, Why, why don't you think your Heavenly Father was among the sinless uh, Savior line? Um, that's actually a really good question. I haven't really thought about that. Um, I think my automatic assumption is just because the vast majority of people will... Who, who become exalted have one sinned. So it's more of an assumption, but there, there is a possibility that my Heavenly Father could have been within the sinless line. So, so fleshing that a little bit, at least, and if I get too far off the path, let me know. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. It, okay, uh, if uh, among those who experience a post-fall mortal probation, sure. it seems virtually everyone, perhaps Latter-day Saints have at times said there's exceptions, uh, maybe that, uh, Typically not. Um, among the post-fallen 
participants of mortality, virtually all of them at least, have been sinners. And so if that's a normative or normal part of the process of becoming a deity, it seems plausible at least, or it seems probable, most likely that among the gods that have been exalted, most of them have been sinners before they were, uh, before they received the atonement of another savior. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I would say that. Um, and I would say that the atonement is enough to make them completely good, okay. as if they never sinned. The atonement renders it as though they never sinned. Yes. Okay. There's, a, there's, a, there's a wrist action here where, uh, the, <laughs> well, the, the audio, it's, a, it's directional enough where I have to be quick enough to, to get back. So, so unless uh, it, like, anyway, sorry. I'm not a professional. Uh, what, so going back to our outline here, was the atonement earth-centric? In other words, I've heard, I mentioned this earlier, um, in a book I read by Andrew Skinner, it seemed like his view is that the atonement as accomplished on this planet, and this is, it reminds me of the second view you described, but it, it, it was uh, at least within the jur- cosmic regional jurisdiction of our Heavenly Father, it seems as though, according to some Latter-day Saint leaders, or thinkers at least, that the atonement uh, was centralized to this planet and accomplished an atonement for all other worlds under Heavenly Father. Yeah, so I would say my view on that is this atonement specifically does apply to all other worlds under Heavenly Father. The reason I've heard for it being on this earth is we needed the example of Jesus Christ on the earth more directly than other people did because we are more sinful than the other worlds of Heavenly Father. That's the explanation I've heard leveraged. Um, I don't necessarily hold that view. I would leave the possibility that Jesus Christ could have appeared on all worlds at the same time performing the same atonement. So it's possible there's a rescinding of a son or the, the son to the others. Yeah. Um, and that would, re, that would require a kind of... Uh, it, not even a rescinding, right? Because I, I subscribe to B-theory of time. So I would just say that time and space are not bound by the same mortal limitations that we see. So it would just be it happening at the same time, um, which okay. is a bit of a wonky idea, but I think it's... Same singular event, but expressed simultaneously on all worlds? Yes. So, uh, in that view, it's really not Earth-centric, but in another view, it sounds like, which it sounds like you're holding out as plausible, at least, sure. Earth might be sort of the home base of the atonement among all the other worlds. Yeah, I think most Latter-day Saint thinkers do subscribe to a more Earth-centric view. It hasn't really been prophetically stated which way to go, so open to interpretation. I personally don't, um, but I'm open to having my mind changed. Okay. Yeah. So infinite regress, I think we're going to touch that a little bit, but uh, is it your view that there definitely is an infinite regress, uh, a never-ending ancestry of deities? Or I, I know that Orson Pratt, you know, him, him, he might have described it in uh, large language, but for him at least, there was a definite beginning. There was a first deity. Um, what's, I, I, maybe I'm having you re- restate, but... Uh, 100% infinite regress of gods. That is doctrine. If you look on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints website, it has as God once was, um, as man. Man, yeah, sorry, as man once was. Um, as man is, God, I, I have to say it all the time, or I have to, as man, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be, yes. and it's and uh, it popularly stated as become, yes. but the original language, I think, as reported by, or there's a paper by Ron Huggins. Uh, it's B. I'm sorry, that's just nerd oh, detail. But. No, totally fine. Yeah, so it, Lorenzo Snow is quoting in that um, instance, and it says on the church's website that we hold that statement as doctrinal. So I think infinite regress of God's definitely a thing. Anyone who says that it isn't, I would say, is going against what the church says is a doctrinal statement. Um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to follow the... I'm, uh, I'm trying to be true to the faith, faithful out of the outline we have. Um, and yet get a little bit of wiggle room to kind of address each point. Yeah, go for it. Um, So Lorenzo Snow couplet, there was a manual, Teachings of the Presidents, and then it was Lorenzo Snow, and they have a chapter on the Lorenzo Snow, and they describe it as kind of almost like a revelatory event. Like it was, it was, um, so, but you take the Lorenzo Snow couplet as not, I've heard some, like Stephen Robinson has described it as sort of quasi-canonical, but I kind of hold out the possibility that it might not be true in the way traditional Latter-day Saints have construed it. And, and well, I, I, I've just heard a lot of straight up, that's not doctrine, that's, sure. that's an interesting teaching, it's not binding. Um, it, uh, I don't know, I, I think some, some Latter-day Saints genuinely seem to want to avoid the couplet's weight, doctrinal weight, in order to, in, in, in some cases, 
So hold the view that there was a first deity or that, that our Heavenly Father perhaps might be the first deity among all deities. Anyway. Yeah, I've definitely seen that a lot too. The reason, uh, what I would say to that is on the church's website, it does say that it's doctrine. So I try to be a more orthodox, traditional, conservative, Latter-day Saint member, however you want to put it. Those are my values. Um, so I would say that I would adhere to that for that reason. And then I would also say it's logically inconsistent to believe in exaltation of mortals um, as we do, right? Because we, we definitively believe in exaltation without believing in an infinite regress, because that would mean that, that we are in a first cause sort of scenario. and it, The first God is special. Yes, the first God is special, and that et eternity going forward has a different pattern than eternity going backwards, um, because there would be no eternity going backwards. And we believe that God organized the universe, right? Like if you read in Abraham and Moses, all matter is eternal, all intelligence is eternal, and, et and intelligence is matter. So I find it really hard to reconcile the view of God as being the first cause within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, just because I don't think the book of Abraham or the book of Moses hashed that out, and the church's website says that it's doctrinal to believe in an infant regress of gods. I think it might just be more of a cultural reaction to wanting God to be more special. Um, but I think there is something inherently more special in believing that God sets an, a divine pattern for us to follow. So I think one eternal round. Yeah, one eternal round. I love this hymn, If You Could Hide a Kolob. Uh, oh yeah, I, I have that somewhere in here, but If You Could Hide, Kola, if you could hide to Kolob, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, if we could find out when the gods began to be, and it, it, it kind of leaves the, it's a rhetorical question or, or statement because it, the, the sense is we don't, there never was a beginning of the deities. He thinks the spirit whispers there is no end to space. There, Yeah, there is no end to space, right? Like the whole point of it is saying that the Holy Spirit would say that there is no beginning and there is no end. So uh, if so, it's even sung, even, in, even by the tabernacle choir. Yeah. And so the idea that, we, that there was an infinite ancestry of gods is celebrated in music uh, in an official capacity of some sort in the conference center. Um, okay, so um, the firstborn sons. I, we touched on this a little bit. I, 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 my wife and I went to a theater play, a play. Um, I forget it was a, I, for, I don't think it was a musical. Um, and I think it was called Brothers. Okay. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. I have heard of it. Someone that I work with likes it a lot. <laughs> I don't know if it's still playing. It was years ago. I have the, the pamphlet that we got when we went in. Now, in this, um, in this play, he, he took the, the producer, did a spin on it, or the writer, and it, it was that who you thought was Jesus ended up being Satan, and who you thought was Satan ended up being... Because they started, both started out good, and for, I think the point he made was that firstborn, it almost sounds evangelical in some sense, the firstborn for him was the one preeminent one, yeah, yeah. but not necessarily uh, in some certain context. Uh, how do we put this? So, uh, I'm, I'm merging different thoughts here. In, in Colossians 1, firstborn, yeah. Jesus is called the firstborn son, and Jehovah's Witnesses say, aha, he's the firstborn of all creation, therefore he's the first created being. And evangelicals respond by saying, no, this means he's preeminent. And it, that, it, in a loose analogy, I, I was reminded of that because the, the writer of the play was like, well, the, the, Jesus as the firstborn sung among the spirit sons of Heavenly Father need not have been the chronological first. Uh, but you're, I think in the way you at least described it last, it, you, you default to him being the chronologically first and preeminent among the spirit sons. 100%. Okay. Sorry if I'm talking too much here. Oh, no, you're totally fine. Um, um, let's see here. RLSS versus free agency. So the royal line of sinless saviors... The idea that among the different branches of a family tree of cosmic regional deities, um, every father sends his chronological firstborn son. And I brought up last time, it seems coincidental, and it seems uh, in, in contradiction to uh, libertarian free will, as Latter-day Saints uh, affirm, and especially in the Latter-day Saint framework. Uh, it's, it's, it, that's even different from open theism from, uh, that stems off from sort of a, a heretical offshoot of evangelicalism, but Mormon open the, the Mormon brand of open theism. Um, how, how can you say with certainty that every firstborn chronological son will definitely become the sinless savior for that branch of the cosmic regional jurisdiction? How, does that, how is that compatible with free will? Sure, okay, so first off, I'm not an open theist. Um, so I do believe that God has infinite foreknowledge of everything. Um, so that kind of reconciles that a little bit more. And I would say with free agency, I have a slightly different perspective than I think most Latter-day Saints do. This is where I get a bit 
I, I'm a little bit different. I would say basically that the will of God isn't what directs you to do things, but choosing the will of God is what liberates you the most and brings you the most happiness. And I think when you're in the pre-mortal state, you are infinitely more likely to choose what God presents as the plan than you are on earth because you don't have those fallen desires. So I think it's a lot harder to choose differently. So I would say there could be, I, I, I'd leave room for a probability that the firstborn son wouldn't choose that. Um, I don't know everything. Would you mind coming yeah. up so the, the oh, sorry, focus yeah. is... Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I figured the focus is on one of us, so... Yeah. Um, okay. Focus is good? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, sorry. I was, I was right to inform him. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So, um, given the right conditions, it sounds like it's certain in pre-mortality, given enough time, given the right circumstances, that a firstborn son will inevitably and, and definitely become a sinless savior role over the, the over the, the 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 branch. Sure. Yeah, I would say it is almost certain. I would leave a tiny bit of uncertainty just because I'm not willing to hardline it. Um, but because of the conditions that they're in, they would be more likely to choose that than anything else. Such that the assumption is that every first chronological firstborn son becomes the savior. Sure, and they would be foreordained to that task. Okay. Foreordained. Uh, describe that in a Latter Day Saint definition. Yeah, definitely. So foreordained is basically called beforehand. So you're called beforehand to do a specific work, and you have the agency to choose whether or not to do that work. But because you know that that work will bring more grace of Christ into your life, you'd be more likely to choose it. Using Latter Day Saint language, it's like getting your calling, but it's in premortality. Yes. Oh, sorry. That's a better explanation. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, intelligences. Yes. So it's hard to recreate the entire path of the conversation we had earlier. Um, but I have all the bullet points here. Intelligences um, are intelligences, people or, or particles or both. And, and I know you taught me something about a different LDS view that I've, I don't think I've heard synthesized before. So please explain. I think they could be both. Um, a lot of the time people will say that they are just particles and that God basically took those particles and then created spirit bodies um, out of those particles, but those particles are not unique to you, that they become unique. But the view that I express and that I've heard expressed more so now, but probably because I've written about it and other people have interacted with it, is this idea basically that you have unique intelligence particles that construct your being and you have always existed as a spirit child um, and you were formed in a different spiritual sense than a literal formation. Okay. So I would say both, but most, pe most people would say particles and we don't really know. There isn't a doctrinal statement on that, but Book of Abraham, Book of Moses seems to suggest that um, intelligence is the same as spirit. Um, that's at least the way that I read it, which is how I created my view. Let's come back to that. I have it in the outline later. I know we kind of briefly touched on it, came back, but um, I have my, as my next bullet point. Do you think uh, individual intelligence as, as, as persons, yeah. do you think they have the capacity for falling in pre-mortality? Yes, I do. I think they have the capacity for falling. Um, I think the um, third part, one of my, just side note, one of my pet peeves is the people who are like, it was one third and two thirds um, when it's... Uh, That's a pretty standard view, right? It is a pretty standard view. But actually, if you look at the language, it's a third part, not necessarily one third and two thirds. What's the difference? Uh, we don't know how many were in the part. We don't know if it's actually one third versus just like there were, we don't know the size of the individual groups. So it doesn't necessarily have to be one third and two thirds. It could be like there was three... Groups. One third of a subset? Yeah, yeah. So like... We don't know how many people that was. Okay. I, I don't know. That's just a pet peeve. So a portion, uh, sort of called a third, but not 33.3%. Yeah. Not yeah, sorry. That was a nerd thing. Um, yeah, but I would say that, yes, you have the capacity to choose against God in the premortal existence. I'm off the path a little bit, but do you think the atonement perhaps retroactively uh, effective here is covering sins that were committed perhaps in premortality? This is a really good question. I actually had a really long discussion with my friends about this the other day. Um, I leave for the possibility of it. I will say the traditional Latter-day Saint view is that you can't um, have that happen, but my personal view is that it does cover the premortal, um, but not the sins of Satan proper. Okay. Not like capital S Satan, but the people who followed him, sure. I would say that the atonement could, but it would be a lot, a lot harder. So there's certain... Uh, uh, people who have rebelled in premortality that are uh, there's no hope for them there's no there's a permanent disqualification they're not there's not there's no there's no like 
uh, there's no second, there's no second or third chance for Satan. There's no second or third chance for Satan proper, but I think there is a second or third chance for the people who followed him. I believe in progression between kingdoms, which is a very contested Latter-day Saint topic. It's pretty divided. Um, I would say that I think that because I believe in progression between kingdoms, I have to logically go then to say the people that follow Satan could also have the opportunity to progress. But if your nature is changed such that you follow Satan, that progression would be rendered almost impossible in my view anyways. So it kind of feels like apples and oranges, but... Slightly possible, but improbable? Yeah, slightly possible, but improbable. Okay. Um, okay. Here's where I was going through this list, and I was like, I don't think I've ever had a conversation with a Latter-day Saint where we covered this kind of material all at once. Uh, uh, multiple godheads versus a single godhead. And the idea here is that I've, I've heard conceptually at least two different models. Um, and one is that uh, all the exalted deities become equal with all other exalted deities, uh, including Heavenly Father. And, uh, it, uh, and uh, one enters into uh, or joins the existing godhead in this view. There's sort of a question mark uh, about heavenly mo mother or mothers or the, wife, the wives of the other three or the three. Um, anyway, so does it expand beyond the three or beyond the six? Um, and the other view I've heard when rarely fleshed out. This is, again, this is pretty tough to find people who flesh these things out typically, but um, another view is that um, there would be a multiplicity of godheads among the exalted deities and uh, in this view, Jesus would be a heavenly father someday over his own branch, um, his own jurisdiction, and then and, and then this is me. This is me sort of fleshing out the, the the implications with my conversation partners on this. So, does Jesus have? Does he have dual membership in two godheads? One in which he's the son, one in which he's the father. In other words, are there overlapping godheads? Um, and then, uh, so I'll hand it off the mic just a second here. But yeah, is, is there dual membership uh, sometimes between godheads? Or is there an overlapping? multiplicity of godheads or is there one uh, singular uh, big godhead of which heavenly father jesus christ and the holy S S ghost um, is a subset representation sort of a sample representation of the larger godhead uh, i'll hand it off yeah yeah so i've definitely heard the first view that's usually referred to as the household of god um, I don't personally subscribe to that view. I'm more inclined to the second view. I would believe that there are multiple different godheads and that you can have dual partnership in those multiple different godheads. So the sun would be um, in two different godheads at least and it would just keep going in that way because I believe that when we are exalted, right, I think there is that same exaltation pattern that exists in other worlds. So you get your group of, you get your group of planets in which you are god over and then you send a savior, that sort of thing. So I would say that it's the second view. And I would also say, with respect to Heavenly Mother, because I feel like I can clarify something about actually, that. Actually, that's the next bullet point. Oh, yeah. perfect. Oh. Was she, is she a member of the Godhead? I would say no. Um, I think a lot of feminists would probably get mad at me for that. Um, I would say, one, I'll, I'll flesh this out. I think God only has one wife. Um, I don't believe in polygamy in heaven. Um, I asked you earlier, do you think polygamy when practiced in a ceiling way, is it nullified in the millennium? Yeah. Okay, so the, I think there's a difference between the ordinance and who you are sealed to with respect to polygamy. I think the, the, the distinction that I would be willing to make is that the sealing ordinance ratifies your exaltation, but it doesn't necessarily matter who you are sealed to in a polygamous sense. So I think there will be one man and one wife, and what matters is that you receive the ordinance and that God will figure out um, who you will be sealed to. Because we covenant to God, we don't covenant to... So, so being married in this sense seems like it's more important than who you're married to and, and uh, yeah. To be honest with you, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so with respect to Heavenly Mother, just kind of circling back to that point so I can flesh it out, um, I would say that there is one Heavenly Mother per God. Um, she is not a part of the Godhead. I think that there is the necessity for priesthood. Um, I think you have to hold the priesthood. I do think women have oh. priesthood power, but I don't think women have women hold the priesthood and that's the distinction I would make is that since they don't hold it they and will never hold it in my view yeah. they are not a part of the godhead but they act as co-creators because they can access priesthood power and I don't think priesthood power originates from God but exists outside of God because of eternal law definitely a bullet point but um, I'm not going to use this word uh, like the culture uses I'm just using it in a minimal sense of sure. male led but the godhead is a patriarchal institution uh, part and parcel uh, priesthood authority. So that's why it's three males. Yeah. Yep. And I think we see that pattern on earth. Um, that's why I think you have scriptures like 
women, uh, wives submit to your husbands. I think there is an inherent patriarchal order within Christianity that's manifested itself in a godly pattern that has taken down to mortality. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know why in our prior discussion we touched on this like really briefly, but you mentioned Jesus being married to Mac Mary Magdalene. Yes, okay. yes, I totally think Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. Um, I have very minimal evidence for that, I'll be completely honest. Um, there's been a couple of prophetic statements where, not not doctrinal statements, but a couple of prophets have espoused the view that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. It makes sense to me because she visited him at the tomb, right? So I would say that that's kind of a sign that she had a especially close relationship with him. So I think Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, personal view. Elohim. I've heard that Elohim equals the Father and Jehovah equals Jesus, at least as a naming convention. Sure. I've heard it uh, in the default cultural view and even the institutional view. It seems like that's an interpretive grid for reading the Old Testament among modern LDS scholars. It's like, no, it's just a naming convention, not a helpful interpretive grid for in, uh, interpreting the words Jehovah or Elohim. But in our prior discussion, you mentioned, I think, that Elohim equals both Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. Yeah, I'm willing to be pressed on that. I would say it depends on the... I, I'll make my view a little bit more fun. I would say it depends on the, the point of scripture that we were talking about. Because um, I looked back and I was like, okay, no. Um, I think Elohim could refer to both the father and the mother. I see no reason for why God would be the sole creator. I think God would co-create with his with his wife because we are made in the image and likeness of God, right? So male and female. So I think that that implies... Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, but there are instances in which there are, there are only things that men can do, and I think those are the instances in which Elohim just means Heavenly Father. So contextual to the usage of the of the term Elohim. Sure, and I think it could be either one. It could be the majestic plural, or it could be plural because it's referring to two people. Now, probably because we mentioned Elohim, we were talking about the oneness of God, mm -hmm. and I, I thought a really interesting part of the conversation was, for me, the oneness of God uh, implies the universe, universal scope of God's dominion, his jurisdiction, that there's no limit or boundary to it. Uh, when we, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, there's a kind of big picture to that. And it sounds like in the Latter-day Saint view, when it's pressed to its implications, the oneness of God actually goes in the other direction, uh, where it's, it's speaking with specificity to a particular regional cosmic jurisdiction uh, branch of the family tree or slice of the pie. Uh, worlds without number, albeit, but um, the oneness of God in that traditional Latter-day Saint view, it, it seems to me, is speaking of particularity or, or, or uh, specificity, whereas the oneness view for classical Christianity, it's, um, it's most high, ultimate, super, 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 superlative, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, uh, without exception, without boundaries, uh, none other, you know, no other jurisdictions, he's over it all. Anyway. No. Yeah, and I would say that we would see God in the same light because that's what he is relative to us, but we also recognize that there is a particularity because there are other gods who other mortals feel the same way about. So I'd say the oneness of God is more relational than it is absolute. Uh, further uh, bullet point, uh, but yeah. we at some point we talked about A versus B theory a time. So yes. it, it describe for uh, us what A and B theory are so I don't talk too much here. Yeah, so A theory is basically linear time. It's the time span that most people understand and most people subscribe to. It's just mortals view of time typically. Whereas B theory, B theory is a lot more complicated. I would describe it best as cyclical time. Um, circular time in the sense that there isn't um, a linear progression of time but there is less of a mortal understanding of time so you think that time is not bound and that things can repeat themselves. I think that's a pretty succinct explanation. So do you think the future happens after the past? Yes. Would that be the A theory, the B theory? So if the future happens after the past, wait sorry, what, past, that would be A theory. But within B theory, things could be actualized at any point on the time frame. I understand. You take the B theory? Yes, I do. I have B theory with qualifications, I would say. I kind of have my own theory of time. I don't think we particularly understand time. I'm not super concerned with time. Um, I, I would say my best my best view of time is more stoic, which obviously stoics influence B theory of time, which is why I describe it as cyclical. I actually don't, I don't know anything about that. Um, okay. So I don't know if you misspoke, but do you think the, the future is subsequent to the past in, in your B theory? Subsequent. Oh, no. Okay. No. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I. Yeah. No. So. Um, okay. They're. They're. They're at the same time. 
Now, is it fair to say that, I mean, if I had a neighbor that moves into Utah, it's like, help, help me understand the Latter-day Saint worldview. And I said, well, if, if he was a philosophical nerd, and, I, and if I said, 98% of Latter-day Saints hold to an A theory of time, and it seems like when Latter-day Saint leaders and, and thinkers and philosophers have fleshed this out, it seems like the dominant view is A theory, that there's a sequence, a linear uh, 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 succession or sequence of time. Yeah, I would say... Blake Osler, for example, super, I mean, I, yeah. I, I can't imagine B-theory going over well with him. Like, no, no, he doesn't like B-theory. Um, <laughs> I would say that the majority of pragmatic Latter-day Saints subscribe to A-theory. I do know personally a couple people who are leaning more towards B-theory or some variation on it. Um, I talked with someone the other day who said they believed in B-theory and he's trying to become an apologist. Um, but yeah, the majority of people believe in A-theory. And I think that's just because of cultural things, to be honest with you. I think if you really think about the Latter-day Saint view, for me, it's very hard to reconcile a theory because then you have to change things about the way we speak about the atonement. Um, I've heard certain Latter-day Saints talk about how we are within a sequence of time, but when we're exalted as a God, we will become timeless. Sure. Uh, so I, I do have a little fun with that. I'm like, well, when do you become timeless? Like, like you're, sure. you're going from being temporal to being atemporal. Like, I don't understand the how you would, I, I understand more how you would jump from being timeless to entering into time, creating it, but I don't understand um, going from being temporal to being timeless. Anyway. So. Yeah, I, I, I would say my view is closer to that, but I wouldn't say that you go to being timeless. I would just say that your perception of the way that time works is perfected. So I'd say that B theory of time is the most probable theory of time that is occurring, but we see through our mortal perspective, A theory in order to reconcile what we know about the universe. And then when we become gods, then we'll be like, okay, B theory was right. But I think you can just kind of skip that and then be like, okay, so it's not that our theory of time changed. It's just that our perception and the way that we experience things changed. I have here in my list is God is membership in a Godhead or the Godhead or a Godhead essential or accidental to the members thereof. In other words, um, so like in the, in the classic Trinitarian view, uh, Jesus is uh, uh, being in the Godhead is essential to his very being. Like it, it's inseparable from his very existence. It, it's part of the meaning of his existence. Uh, it, there's no sense in which Jesus was outside of the Godhead and then he entered into the Godhead. Um, there was no, he didn't spend an infinite amount of time apart from Heavenly Father and then sort of shake hands, initiate a relationship. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit's relationality, their relationship, their loving each other, um, using loose language here, sort of built into the very being of God. It's, it's just part and parcel. It's what it means to be God. Um, it doesn't sound that way in the classical Latter-day Saint view. It sounds like... Um, uh, a Godhead is something you enter into. It's something that you join. It's, not, it's a membership that you um, achieve or initiate. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't use the word achieve. I think everything's done through the atonement of Christ. Um, the, the way that I would understand it and explain it is not necessarily that you enter into it. You experience it as an entering into. But in my view of time, anything that has already happened has already happened. Anything that is happening is happening. And anything that will happen is the same as if it already happened or is happening. Um, because I believe that anything that is actualized or will be actualized is already actualized. Um, so I know that sounds a little bit weird, but basically because I don't see time as linear, I don't see you as entering into it. If you're going to become a God, if that is something that will happen, it has already happened in my sense of time. Um, so in the linear mainstream view of time in Latter-day Saints, it sounds like Heavenly Father and Jesus have spent an infinite amount of time, an, an unspecified, large, uh, endless infinite. amount of time, infinite amount of time yeah. before they became father and son, before they had the relationship as father and son. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. And I, I wouldn't say that detracts from it being essential to their being, um, because I would say something can become essential to you based on your experience in time. So while I personally don't really agree with that view of time, I'd say that um, right, like I am currently not a mother, right? So, but when I have kids, being a mother will be essential to my being. Um, so I think your different roles become essential as time progresses, and that would be the explanation I would say is most probable for that. I know this is sort of a winding path, but um, yeah. oneness, multiple godheads, one godhead. It sounds to me like uh, a lot of Latter day Saints define the oneness, among other things, as a oneness of purpose. Sure. So the question is, if you take the multiple Godheads view, multiple, especially overlapping Godheads, um, why would they be distinct Godheads if they share the same purpose? I'm sort of replaying how we 
flesh this out earlier, but. Yeah, so they would share the same purpose because the purpose is to reflect eternal law. So I don't believe that God, God legislates anything. I believe that God expresses the eternal laws that exist around him. So the eternal law that exists in my mind is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of mankind. So I'd say that they are one in purpose because they are trying to express the same eternal law that they have identified and because they have been perfected, that is their that is their telos, like that is their end, that is their goal. Um, so they were one in purpose and I would also say, like I'd go beyond that and say that they're one in ethics, they're one in morality because they perf they perfectly understand this eternal law which I define as priesthood. So it sounds like there's a common purpose among all the Godheads, but this, if I'm, I'm just kind of retrieving yeah. our prior, prior discussion, it sounds like the distinction of the Godheads, though, there is introduced, at least at some level, a particular purpose for each Godhead that is that is particular to that Godhead, not in another. So there, there's a, there, and, I, and maybe this was wrapped up in the regional cosmic jurisdiction, yeah. that there's a purpose that that Godhead has for their regional jurisdiction that another Godhead doesn't, maybe. I wouldn't necessarily say that another Godhead doesn't. I would say that the purpose is the same, but it can look different. But the ultimate purpose is for everyone who wants to follow Jesus Christ or wants to follow whoever is their Messiah. The, the purpose of the Godhead is to ensure the immort uh, immortality and eternal life of them. So I get the question I had earlier was, then why is it not one big Godhead? If they had, if they share the same purpose, I'm kind of I'm importing here the sure. oneness definition that I've heard elsewhere. So if, if they share the same essential purpose, why aren't they uh, a singular collective Godhead? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I would say that oneness can be generalized and also localized. So I'd say that they have a localized oneness within themselves and they have a generalized oneness, right? Because I also believe that because of sealing ordinances, everyone will become related. They will be all grafted into the covenant. Or like, I think we're all literal children of God. That's my view. Um, but we will also, through our ordinances, which we perform for the dead as well, will be created as a family of God. So I would say the multiple Godheads aren't necessarily the same purpose in the sense that they all are united. Um, so and, they, they have a different locale though. Yeah, they have a different locale, but they have the same purpose. It's kind of like you have a bunch of different baseball teams, okay? But they're all gonna go play baseball. Like the, the Red Sox and I don't know, the Cubs, there we go. There's a second baseball team. The Red Sox and the Cubs, they are one in the sense that they play baseball and they both have the same goal of winning, but they're a different team. Um, we've already covered a lot of these. We've already covered a lot of these bullet points uh, preemptively. Um, wow, we we did a really good job of already covering a lot of these. Uh, oneness. This is sort of rehashing, but oneness as a distinguishing feature. I think you just did that. It's like there's there's a general common purpose and there's a locale purpose. Yes. Okay. Um, Isaiah 43.10. So we mentioned this, we had a discussion last time we were here, yeah. and uh, Isaiah 43.10 was mentioned just for the audience. Isaiah 43.10, uh, before me no God was formed, neither shall there be any after me. And there's other Isaiah passages like uh, Heavenly Father, that, well, important, uh, that Yahweh um, has never been taught the path of justice. He's never been taught anything. He's incomparable to any other deity. Uh, he's the first and the last. Elsewhere it says, uh, He's never been given a gift. Uh, and so when I, when I just stack up, a, when I do a table contrast, uh, the, the God of classical Christianity, which I take to be the biblical view, has never learned, never received a gift, is incomparable to any other deity, doesn't share his glory with any other, he says. Uh, he's one, he's the most high, he's the first and the last. Before him, no gods were formed. In the Latter-day Saint view, it sounds like he, he learned everything he knows, he received everything he has. He has an infinite ancestry of deities. He's comparable in some substantial sense to all other exalted deities. Um, he does share his glory with others. Uh, so what do you do with the Isaiah passages? Why, why not take those and worship God as how I've described him? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I would say that there are a couple different avenues that I could take. I would say the first one is the one that I personally subscribe to. It's this idea that the, the, those attributes of God are with respect to us because the Hebrew Bible as well as the Greek Bible was written in order so that we might understand God. And our understanding of God is with respect to who we are. So I would say that that doesn't necessarily mean that there is no other gods. I would say that means that for us there is no other gods. That's the importance of the regional cosmic that we've talked about earlier. Um, 
that he is our regional cosmic deity and to us he is all those things that's the first view the second view is right so the word canon it's a greek word it means measuring stick so i'd say in order for something in my view to be an eternal truth that has to corroborate across all of the standard works. And I, you know, I hold the Hebrew Bible, the Greek Bible, many people call it the Greek Testament, I just call it the Greek Bible, um, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Book of Mormon, and then the Pearl of Great Price. So for me, truth is found by using a measuring stick and determining what's common across all of those. So in my view, because you have you would have to do the intellectual rigor of doing that to determine what is the first level of doctrine then you can easily say that you know people who are writing things down that have been changed over time could have been wrong we don't know what the original text of the hebrew and greek is we have a fairly great approximation i'm not one of those people who thinks there's nefarious monks um copying things down incorrectly um i would say we have a fairly good approximation i don't think every single word of scripture has to be literally true or even metaphorically true i think the people who are writing it could have made mistakes um, so i would say that that's why there is the necessity for the standard works because it offers things to compare against um, so i would say you could easily just say okay so because it's not comparable across all the standard works it is not necessarily true um, and then you can come back to the regional cosmic view and be like okay because god is this to us it is true for us in this sense is what i would say to that would you say there's certain things in the hebrew bible or the greek bible that are not true and that have been sort of clarified as not true by subsequent revelation that supersedes the the, the biblical canon Sure, in the same sense that like the Greek Bible supersedes the Hebrew Bible, right? Like we don't practice all the laws in Leviticus anymore. So I'd say that the Hebrew Bible definitely we see the law of Moses being fulfilled, and for me the law of Moses being fulfilled, um, the law of Moses was a way to regulate the eternal laws that God has, and He wanted to regulate the people in order for them to develop the most righteousness. But then in the Greek Bible we move to a more principled approach to the expression of the law. So the Sermon of the, on the Mount expresses all of the principles of the law of Moses, but doesn't offer very um, didactic, I guess, um, approaches to living, um, whereas our revealed revelation also keeps the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but just reveals them in a different way to achieve the same principles. It's easier for me to think about progressive revelation when it comes to things like ritual purity and the fulfillment of such things and um, sort of an, an intensification of an ethic or an, an expounding on an ethic. But when it comes to like straightforward statements about the nature of God, do you think that it's it plausible or possible that there are certain straightforward statements about the nature of God in the Old or New Testament that have just been uh, revealed to be not true by subsequent LDS canon. Yes, I would hold for that possibility. And the reason I would hold for that possibility is because I, I know when I write, right, I'm not claiming to be equal to a prophet, I'm much lesser. But when I write, I make mistakes and I make a lot of mistakes. And I think that when people are trying to express their love of God and trying to express who God is to them, you can make mistakes. Um, so I would say that for them, that's how they would describe God, but that doesn't necessarily make it true. And what makes it true is more of a collective witness um, sure. to the nature of God. So official doctrine, uh, you, I, I'm, maybe I'm asking you to rehash something, but um, how would you define official doctrine? And uh, in short, how do you know when to reject something that's in uh, a part of the canon? Sure, yeah, that's a really good question. So I'd say official doctrine in my view is what corroborates across the canon or what the church directly says is doctrine, right? Because I believe in prophetic authority and I believe in an apostolic structure that, so if anything that the quorum of the 12 apostles and the first presidency says is doctrine is definitely doctrine or says in a collective statement, for example, the family of proclamation to the world, that is definitely doctrine. Um, in terms of your second question about the canon, um, I would say that it has to corroborate with other things in the canon. So if it's just in the Hebrew Bible and it's not also evidenced in other parts of scripture then I would say that it could be true it doesn't necessarily have to be false but if it d directly disagrees with the rest of the canon then I would say okay we have to explore that um, and see whether or not it's true and then kind of take a guiding principle and determine truth from that and my personal guiding principle is basically this idea that the atonement of Christ is infinite, that the atonement of Christ has a specific structure, and you use that to analyze scripture. Okay. Um, I know this is a winding path. Yeah. It's my bullet points here. Um, Revelation 4.8, Revelation uh, the angels surround God and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Um, a, a little bit of rehashing here, but why not take that to mean that Heavenly Father um, has always been holy never was a sinful mortal, 
um, that he is uniquely holy, uh, uh, set apart, uh, holy, 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 uh, holy in such a way that is unique and, and different from any others. Um, and, then, and, and because he's unique, he's uniquely worthy of worship for being holy, 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 who was and is and is to come. Uh, why not take that in a classical Christian uh, view? Sure. Can I actually ask you a question? Please do. Okay. So when you were baptized, did you consider yourself holy? The moment that you were baptized? Not holy, holy, holy. Uh, like just yeah. holy, one, one holy. Uh, I, I'm not evading. I'm trying to be really substantive here. Oh, yeah, you're fine. Sure, sure. Uh, not perfect. Not perfect. Um, perfectly forgiven. Yes. Um, still sinner. Set apart. Uh, a, so a saint in that sense. That's, that's how I think of holy. Well, so, uh, so saint means sanctified. Right and sanct, apart, yeah. yeah, and sanct, yeah, sanctified, right? So that is the same word as holy within the scriptures. Right. So I would say that I, I'm, this is where I get a little unorthodox. I'd say the moment of baptism, when you are baptized, you are cleansed, perfectly forgiven from your sins, and in that moment, like not a second afterwards, because you will probably have a bad thought enter your mind, or you will say something, or but that moment you are perfect because Christ's atonement is infinite. So I'd say that holiness doesn't mean that you are always free from sin. Um, I think holiness means that you have become free from sin. So holy, 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 sure. who was and is and is to come. Why not take that to mean the Heavenly Father has been superlatively holy from, uh, from uh, both directions, uh, from all A or B or three of time, whatever, that he's never, ever, in any sense, ever been a sinner. Um, I don't think that you necessarily exegetically need to do that. Um, I think if it's said that he was always holy expressly and explicitly, then we would have to have a different conversation about the rest of the canon. But I think you could say that relative to us, he is holy, holy, holy. So that's going back to that idea of localization. Now you talked about super superlative, and I know it was just yeah. sort of your yeah, idiosyncratic yeah, term. Uh, why not take that holy, holy, holy as a super superlative? Why? Uh, what you know? Why why relativize that or reduce that to? I'm being uh, almost facetious here, but just being a superlative. Why yeah, yeah, yeah. why is it not a super superlative in your view? Because it doesn't have. So in Greek, you need a host, and then you need the 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 word afterwards to be in the superlative case to have the next level of superlative, which is which I call the super superlative. There's probably a better term for it than that. Um, so I would say that because grammatically it says holy, 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 it isn't implying that it is as holy as possible. It's just saying holiest, which allows for some level of localization, right? Because Greek allows for as for a form of as holy as possible. So holy uh, in a uh, heightened sense, at least, yes. relative to those who are in his jurisdiction, uh, perhaps locally to his angels yes. so more holy than the angels but not necessarily someone who has always been holy in the highest sense yes and he is holiest in the highest sense now and he's holiest in the highest sense for the rest of eternity but not holiest in the highest sense forever but again this goes back to my view of time where i would say that because he's the holiest now he's always been the holiest because yeah but we're plowing through here um by the way this is totally where i'd want to come in and be fiercely uh you know, critical and yeah, sure. rebuke you and uh, <laughs> refute and uh, preach, you know, the holiness of God um, as uniquely holy and, and um, super superlatively holy. Sure. Um, so uh, eternal law, uh, uh, eternal law. It, okay, how, how shall I introduce this? Um, in the classical Christian view, there, there's this thing called the Euthyphro dilemma where, um, I, th I don't know if it was a Greek thinker asked, um, essentially does god create the standard of goodness you know fiat by fiat or does he himself submit to another source a, a, a higher law than himself an, out, an external law um, and and if you choose either one it sort of it seems to violate the spirit of monotheism because in the one uh, uh goodness is arbitrary you know it's just sort of like he could have made a different standard of morality that was um flipped uh, or, in the other view, he's not really, it, it violates the spirit of monotheism because he's not the highest standard. There's a standard external to him that's higher than him. So the classical Christian uh, splitting of the horns is to say, well, that goodness is, is definitionally the very character of God. So when God uh, pronounces a law, it's an extension or ex an expression of his inherent goodness, his inherent character. Uh, so he is the definition of goodness. Um, so in, in the Latter-day Saint view, as I understand it, there is an eternal law, and this gets really, we can flesh this out. Yeah. 
a standard um, of what is right and good um, of eternal uh, priesthood. But this law is it's co-eternal with all other persons. Uh, it is not owing to a singular personal being. Uh, there's no personal being that this eternal law is rooted in or founded on or based on. So uh, this is, I'll just, I'll just kind of throw out a little critique for the purpose of having you sort of explain how you're thinking about this. It starts to sound like a platonic form in the Latter-day Saint view where the gods are instantiating or uh, abiding by an external standard. And the, um, the irony for me is that the critique I've heard of Nicaea, of okay. the Trinity, is that the God of classical Christianity is without body parts or passions, which has a kind of uh, classical meaning, but the rhetorical effect of that in modern uh, rhetoric is that he is without love, he's, he's not personal. Um, so but it, the irony here is it sounds like eternal law in the Latter-day Saint framework is an impersonal law owing to no personal being without body parts or passions and in some sense is God because it is the ultimate governing force. Uh, so how would you uh, flesh that out or respond to that or critique that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll push back a little bit. Um, so Donald Perry actually wrote a really great paper on Genesis 1 where he talks about how the word created in Hebrew can actually be translated as organized. Um, so I would say that the that God organizes things according to eternal right. So there are these principles that exist outside of God that do govern the universe. But I would not say that that makes them God because in the same sense that I wouldn't say that that God God is not God because he governs us. God is God because he has internalized the law perfectly and become perfected through an atonement. Um, so my view is essentially that this eternal law, I would call it priesthood power. Um, I haven't seen anyone else do that, but I think that that's what makes the most sense theologically. Um, I would say that this eternal law exists in order to teach God um, when he was mortal how to become God and that's why we have these divine patterns that follow and this is how I think you can reconcile the law of Moses with the gospel of Christ because it's not just an expression of God's goodness because God has internalized the law right Jesus Christ internalized the law too Jesus Christ taught us to internalize the law in the Sermon on the Mount right because he's saying that essentially or like with the take my yoke upon you um, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light um, that is not saying that Jesus Christ takes away your burdens that's an often misread passage it's saying that take upon me take upon me my interpretation of the law and internalize the law of Moses instead of just acting out of a necessity for the law so I'd say that part of godliness is being is having the law internalized because the law is what is good and you become good when you internalize the law what does it mean for the law to govern sure. and what does it mean for uh, an impersonal idea a law to govern it seems like governance is necessarily something done by governors, and governors uh, inherently sounds personal. So what does it mean for an impersonal law to govern uh, all the regional cosmic jurisdictions? I would I would compare it to gravity. Um, I would say that gravity is a principle that, um, right, so like if I dropped that microphone, it would fall to the ground, definitely. I wouldn't say that that's the will of God. I would say that there is this force called gravity, and I'm sure that you would say that God created gravity to, in order to, you know, basically keep everything down. But I would say that this force exists outside of God in order to regulate the affairs of the universe. So it acts as more of a regulatory principle as opposed to a governing principle. And I would say that that differentiation provides a bit of a shade that makes it easier to understand and digest because in that sense, we are not directed by eternal law because we do not co comprehend eternal law. But God perfectly comprehends eternal law and he expresses that to us in a way that makes him the governor. So there's no ultimate lawgiver and he's abiding by this law and he's sort of the conduit or mediator, uh, enforcer of the law? Yeah, so he's the enforcer of the law for the local jurisdiction of God, uh, of people that exist. I heard this. I heard this phrase in a prior discussion that the universe self-governs. Yes. Uh, is that what does that mean? Or, or I, I guess I'm hearing the qualification here that it, that that might mean for you that it's self-regulating. It's 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 its own standard. But maybe now you're saying it's not actually governing anything. Not even itself. It's just it's a description of a standard. It's a uh, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I would say that there is a degree of self-governance. I would definitely still hold to that and say that there is a degree that like matter is eternal for me, right? So 
God did not create intelligence and God is made of intelligence. So because of that, intelligence exists as an eternal thing and that there are there are principles, there are laws that act upon intelligence eternally. Cleon Skousen has a really great um, talk, talk, it's called the Gospel Trilogy, that kind of explains this in a more eloquent way than I can. Um, but basically, so because there are these eternal laws, instead of them being self-governing completely, they self-govern certain aspects and then when God internalizes the law, then he's able to express things and create. So creation is done as more organization in relation to an internal law as opposed to God just creating things. So like the best example is a more limited omnipotence. Um, so I would say that God can't draw a square circle because a circle cannot be a square. That's essentially what I would say. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna pause for a second and ask Bradley about battery. Bradley, how do we do for battery and stuff? Okay, cool. Um, uh, okay, so winding path. Apologies, it's my notes. From my, I, so I, I took notes from our prior discussion, trying to recreate essentially the path that we were on last time, and, and hopefully the diesel engines aren't as uh, terrible this time. So. Um, so it sounds like, in this view, God is. Uh, um, he is not the ultimate source of what is good. He is the ultimate source of what is good with respect to us, but he is not the definition of good. The definition of good and the definition of bad exists outside of God. Uh, it's hard for me to do the volley here without embedding critical thought here, but um, it sounds like in this view, God is downstream. That he's a conduit. He's, he is drawing from another prior source of good receiving that, uh, in, uh, internalizing that. Um, so, uh, okay, on that note, if you have any thoughts on that? Or yeah, actually I have one. I would say that it's the same as when we become sanctified, right? So when we become sanctified, we become perfected. So when, I believe when Christ, Christ's atonement is infinite for me personally. So when I go to heaven and I'm resurrected and Christ makes me perfect, I don't earn perfection. When Christ makes me perfect, then I become good. So I would say that that's how you kind of get over the distinction. There was a sanctification process for God, except if he was one of the sinless saviors. Um, there was a sanctification process that made him good. So he's not just a conduit. He's also be, he also has become good. So he's instantiated goodness. Uh, he's, he's embodied what sounds like a platonic form, something approximate to that. Sure, I'm a, radical, I'm a radical materialist, so I'm okay with using platonic forms to describe it. I think that that's a fair way to do it. Let's come back to that. Um, uh, it sounds like evil, in the, so in the classical Christian view, uh, and this is a statement that totally needs a patient unfolding. The definition of evil is God-centered in the classical Christian view. And what I mean, and that's like, whoa, what do you mean Second, by that? Yeah, secondary cause, right? Well, not even that. I, okay. uh, even, um, I, I define evil as a perversion of good, and good is God. Uh, goodness is uh, from God, rooted in God, founded on God. So um, the evilness of evil uh, uh, is evil <laughs> because it violates the nature of God. Uh, and that is the highest uh, and most and the deepest definition of evil. Evil is a bending of the straight line that God has uh, given us. Uh, and it sounds like evil... Um, in the Latter-day Saint framework, the, the, the dominant or the traditional framework of Latter-day Saint thought. Evil is co-eternal with all the gods. Uh, it has been around as long as God has been around. Um, in fact, in some A theory, at least, framework, evil predates the exaltation of God. Um, uh, in this view, good is not ultimately owing to our particular God, but neither is evil definitionally, ultimately, operative word, a perversion of the goodness of God. So, Sure, yeah, I would agree with that to a degree. I would say that, so, right, there must needs be opposition in all things, so I think that there has to be good and evil in existence. But I would say that these good and, this good and evil is defined by eternal law, and God understands what good and evil is. And because he has become good, then it's not ultimately a perversion of him because the original existence of good and evil exists outside of God, in my view. But he expresses what good is, and because he expresses what good is, we can then comprehend what bad is or what evil is. And then that is a, it's a perversion of the expression of good that God expresses. 
in, interjecting my own views here, yeah. just really blatantly here, um, for classical Christians, um, the the visceral badness of evil um, is an offense to God. It's 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 uh, it's it's ultimately wrong because it's offensive to God. Because it contradicts God, um, it it uh, it blasphemy is wrong ultimately because it contradicts who God is. So. I don't know if you want to respond to that, but it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would say that it's the same for us, though, right? But, but we may believe that because God has become good, who He is, evil is offensive to that. So I would say that the view of time is really critical here. Right? Whereas you believe that God has always been good since He was, since He caused Himself into being. I think that's a fair way to ex- no. Uh, was never caused into being. Uh, okay, so uh, ca- he, uncaused. Uncaused. Okay. Uh, first uncaused. Okay. Um, so I would say that because God became good, that evil offends God in the same way, but it's a process of becoming as opposed to a process of always being. Yeah. And I would say that that distinction for me doesn't really, I don't think we need to change any rhetoric around that distinction to say that evil is always offensive to God. So like the like baseball analogy. Yeah. Um, somebody learns the rules of baseball and plays it really well, and uh, when the umpire doesn't get, uh, when the umpire makes a bad call on a strike, uh, it offends maybe the, the what do you call it, the manager of it, the, the Yankees, um, but not because he's the creator of baseball, but because he has internalized and he has a vested interest in the rules of baseball. Is that I know that's a super loose analogy. Is that in the same vein maybe? Yeah, and I would say that a, a good analogy that would work for us too is. Be- when we become sanctified through Christ, then the idea of evil becomes so repulsive to us that we learn to become eventually, not in this life, as offended by evil as God is, right? Our, our natures can be changed as such that we cannot conceive of evil as good ever. Most High, uh, Winding Path, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go we talked about how um, the sense in which Latter-day Saints seem to see God as the Most High has a particular reference point. So um, God is the most high, as I see it in the Latter-day Saint thought, relative to his regional jurisdiction, uh, relative to his people. Um, It's not an ultimately unique most high status, um, but it's my observation is that in the Latter-day Saint worldview, um, you and your siblings, uh, your spirit siblings, um, I use all these particular terms like that to be descriptive, but I know they're not like common verbiage, but your spirit, so you and your spirit siblings in the Latter-day Saint framework are the reference point for the holiness of God, for, for, the, for the most high status of God. Um, whereas in the classical Christian view, the most high status uh, holds prior to our existence, independent of our existence, and over and against. Our, it, 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 um, it's not dependent on... Um, it's not specific to a regional cosmic jurisdiction where it sounds like the, okay, I'll, I'll put it more bluntly, sorry. It sounds like in the Latter-day Saint view, most high just means more high. And it doesn't mean ultimately the first or the most high over all the regional cosmic jurisdictions. Okay, so I would push back and I would say that the most high, yes, you could take the regional cosmic deity sort of take on it, but you could also say that most high is with respect to eternal law and that when you are perfected, within the boundaries of eternal law then you become most high so there can be multiple most high just like a good example is i don't know there are multiple people that won the world series okay so like there are multiple we're just going to go for baseball analogies there are multiple teams that won the world series with respect to their league they are the most high in that instance that does not mean for that season yeah for that season that does not mean that like when the yankees won the world series they were like more or less high than when the Red Sox won the World Series. So I'd say that most high is just the description of what perfection is, and perfection is being cleansed through an atonement, sanctified through an atonement, according to the principles of eternal law, which is natural law. The way I've described this to my kids as early as like four, maybe three, is God can win all the arm wrestling matches. And so um, if you put God, figuratively speaking, in, in a room, no one can beat him, and he can beat all the others. Um, I, that it doesn't sound like that would be. Um, I, I couldn't transfer that kind of language to the Latter-day Saint worldview. It's not quite clear who would win in an arm wrestling match between all the most highs of all the regional cosmic jurisdictions. So. It would be a draw because they're all the most highs, so it would just be the most highs competing against the most highs. Uh, okay, so 
romantic hyperbole. Yeah. So I describe my wife uh, <laughs> in romantic overstatements sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you're the best X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a lovely sentiment, lo you know, I, by the way, I learned early, early in my marriage, I was really bad at employing romantic uh, <laughs> language like that. And I learned to be more comfortable with it later. But um, if I were to tell my wife, um, you're the best wife in the whole universe, um, I would have to have an implicit or explicit qualifier to that. And it's these two little words that make the universal scope of the statement suddenly like sucked, reduced down to like the jurisdiction of where I live in South Jordan, Utah, in my house, for me. You're the best wife in the universe for me. And that, those two little words, like, they take, they take an, like a, an overstatement, essentially, and they relativize it, and they, they make it a reference point for it. In the classical Christian view, um, we don't want to treat language about God that way. We don't want to treat it like it's a, it's a lovely exaggeration or a sentimental overstatement. So when we call God the Most High, we, we really want it to mean Most High. So the question I asked you in a prior discussion is if somebody walked in on a family reunion of the gods with Heavenly Father, um, Heavenly Grandfather, Great Grandfather, the Spirit Uncles, uh, you know, the, sort of the, the council of all the exalted gods, and somebody, you know, sort of a messenger walks in and says, will the Most High please stand up? And I asked you, like, well, who should stand up? Yeah, so I'm going to ask you a question real quick. Um, when you say somebody, is this person mortal or is this person a god? Uh, I, don't, I don't mean for that part to be like determinative for the metaphor. Sure. I don't know if it matters. Like, um, I would say, I would say uh, let's just say mortal. Yeah. Say, okay, that makes it easier for me. So I would say that um, if the god present is the regional cosmic deity, then that god would probably stand up. But I would say that it would be fair for all of them to stand up. So if, if one of the exalted gods walked in as a messenger and said, will the most high please stand up? He would also stand up. That's, that's what I wanted to make the point is that- Everybody stands up. Everyone stands up. Okay. Uh, Okay, we talked about the two natures of Jesus. I'm not sure how we got there. Sure. You might have asked me a question. Um, Did we talk about the two natures of Jesus? I thought we talked about that separately. Goodness, I, yeah. I, it's in my notes. So oh, yeah, yeah, I trust your notes. I just don't God know. has no, uh, God is not a mere idea. Okay, yeah. Um, yes, he, uh, yeah, because oh, we talked about the Trinity. I remember that. You asked me to define the Trinity. Three persons, distinct. Uh, differentiatable, yep. um, an eternal love relationship, uh, one essence, one nature, one God. Um, and I think you might have asked me about the embodied nature, maybe. Of yeah, the I asked you about the embodied nature of Jesus Christ. And I did say that God is not an idea, even within the Trinitarian point of view. And if you're a Latter-day Saint and you're watching this, please stop saying that the Trinity God is an idea because it's not. Okay. Yeah. And you have a Catholic background, so you... Yes. you, you you don't agree with the Catholic view, but you're sympathetic to at least the correct understanding of the Catholic view or, or the classical Christian Trinitarian formulations. Yeah, definitely. I went to Catholic college for a little bit. Um, I learned from some really great Jesuit priests, and I think it's really important to get it right and to not just say that the Trinity is just an idea or the Trinity is just like this impersonal God, because for the people who define the Trinity, the Trinity is very personal. So so it might be critiqued as not existing by a Latter-day sure. Saint. But um, at least when it comes to uh, steel manning or refuting the idea, the idea as such is that he's personal. Um, and I think I might have, you might have asked me about God embodied. Jesus has a body. He has parts. He has passions. And, uh, he, he's human. Um, the word passions means different things. I figure that. Yeah, um, emotions. Yeah, he has emotions uh, that are subject to sort of external for you know like like a, a human gets tired and you know yeah, is it hungry, tempted to eat fish yeah yeah so I, I take jesus to have body parts and passions in his human nature because he has two natures a divine nature and a human nature um okay so in the oh i got some uh, mosquitoes coming after me i like to say evangelists are like mosquitoes we get excited about large groups of people so that's evangelist not evangelical uh, evangelists are doing the active work of proselytizing stuff like that so yeah yeah um, uh, in the Trinity, there is an, an inherent relationality. There's a lover, there's the beloved, there's, there's love, there's, there's, this, there's this 
internal love relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when I think about Islam, for example, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll say critically, the, the God, yeah, a singular person view of God where there's no, oh, that was a very mild sneeze. Um, <laughs> Being being normal sick, and you're not normal sick, but being normal sick in a COVID season is, yeah, is no. like. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in the Trinity, there's there's love, there. There's relationship, in the Trinity, from all eternity. Um, so the, it, creation's not an act. It's not a, a, a an addressing of God's loneliness. Um, it doesn't increase his his glory. Uh, it, it's an expression. It's an, it, it, as it were, it's an overflow of who we already is. Yeah, yeah. Um, Whereas the Latter-day Saint view of eternal law seems to be impersonal. I know this is a bullet point that we've kind of already yeah, yeah, addressed yeah. here. Um, I would just I would push back on that a little bit and say that because we believe that we have always existed, that God's not creating us impersonally. God is organizing us personally for his world. So the other bullet point, other bullet point I have here is that ideas are inseparable from instantiation. So it sounds I think this is me summarizing what it sounds like you yeah. said earlier, that um, eternal law is inseparable from the individual uh, intelligences, the persons yeah. that are co-eternal with it, that, that, that there's an interdependence between eternal law, which is impersonal, and the personal persons yeah. that co-eternally exist with it. Um, so it's not that there's this independent, so I, I guess I gotta ask, flesh that out. What, what does it mean for a law to be dependent on co-eternal persons? The law is not what what is dependent. We are dependent upon the law, because the law. So the law exists co-eternally with us, but we must act in accordance with the law. So there are things that are actors and things that are acted upon. So I would just say that that basically is just a regulating force of our existence. It gives us boundaries within an infinite number of choices. Um, I would say that you still have infinity within the bounds and that's a that's a philosophical concept that you can reconcile that there's a bounded sense of infinity um so the eternal law gives us principles in which we can act and defines what we are able to act again like you can't draw a square circle so that what that's what it means for us to be dependent upon the law and what? the law is described the law is described to us by god sorry uh, yeah uh, it sounds like i wrongly inferred that you think there's an interdependence whereas really there's yeah. a singular direction dependence um, but it, it, uh, inseparability. Inseparable, yeah. but not interdependent. interdependent. Yeah, okay. that's what I want to flush out. Okay. Sam Brown wrote a paper. This it, so, is funny. Uh, we're like trying to replay an existing conversation. Yeah. With, with better audio, with better field mic. Um, and I feel like the conversation's been better. Oh, uh, uh, more battery yeah. uh, and, and more time to kind of unfl un uh, flesh yeah. out the stuff. Um, less diesel engines and less motorcycles. True. Um, Sam, Br Sam Brown wrote a paper called why Mormons probably aren't materialists. And yes. I thought it was a really helpful paper because up front he describes the different uh, views. I think it's Adam Miller. Um, I forget the, they actually forget the personal represent, the, the sort of the flagship people over the different views. But there's different sort of levels of materialism or kinds of materialism. And it sounds like, uh, it sounds like Brown, I'm reaching back to my memory here, um, thinks that there are some immaterial uh, things uh, that exist um, and I think he might have tied that into eternal law and the light of Christ um, whereas I think maybe Adam Miller is more of a radical materialist I forget the third view but it, it, I remember from our prior discussion that you said that you thought that the eternal law that you're a radical materialist and so I, I pressed you on that so would you say eternal law is a material and so I asked you um, does it have parts? Uh, and I know that this is sort of an un unanswered question, but can you like conceivably divide up eternal law into two halves where you have this part of it and that part of it? Does it have, yeah. Yeah, I would say that, I would say that you can't divide. <laughs> I would say that you can't divide it up into parts. I kind of fleshed out my thinking on this. I would say that just because something is material does not mean that it's divisible, right? Like you have atoms that which cannot be cut um, that's atoms in the the Cretan sense, not necessarily in the modern sense. But you have a you have a form of matter that cannot be cut because it is so small. Um, so would, it, would eternal law be a single single particle, an atom? I think it, I, I envision it. I'm not entirely sure, so I could be really wrong. I envision it kind of like a veil. Um, like a sheet. Yeah, sure, like a very thin sheet that covers everything. 
So it's a single thing, but it's a single material thing. Yes. Now, for a thing to be material, um, it's funny. I was critiqued earlier by somebody we know. It was like on, on the basis of like you, you arrive at some sort of irreducible thing in your worldview, and you're like, define that. And, and it's like, well, you can't, it, you it's, can't it's like. It be, it's harder and harder to define anything that becomes fundamental or foundational or yeah. irreducible in any worldview. Yeah, yeah. So um, what does it mean for eternal law to be a thing, to be, uh, to be material? To, I mean, uh, in, in, in earthly terms, we think of uh, as weight or color or shape. Um, uh, so yeah, what does it mean for eternal law to be material? Yeah, I'm going to answer that with an analogy. So uh, Mike Pope wrote a really brilliant paper. I think it's in the Journal of Biblical Literature that talks about the dissemination um, in Luke and he describes it as a material exchange where you know the angel comes down to Mary and says like basically you're going to conceive of a child and he says that at that moment you can take a materialist view and see the word of the Lord as being material entering into Mary and that causing her to be pregnant so I would say the way that I would describe it is the eternal law causes things to happen and in that sense, it's a finer sense of material. It's a finer sense of matter that we do not completely comprehend, but functions in a similar sense to the analogy that I just described. It's a directive material. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, won't, I won't pretend to... I'm, I'm acknowledging because I think I sort of get it, but I don't, uh, I'm not, I don't want to pretend it's, like I completely get it. Um, yeah, Luke, uh, the paper is really good. It's by Mike Pope. It's in the Journal of Biblical Literature. He's a BYU professor of classics. He's very brilliant. Uh, an atomic theory of intelligence. So you... Uh, so this is sort of uh, uh, circling back to something we, in this conversation, have already kind of preempted. Um, that all intelligence is reducible to parts. Um, and so there's intelligences and there's intelligence. Yeah. And the main views that I've sort of known about expressed in different ways. The Brigham view, for example. Intelligence is collectively the stuff of reality and the, the begetting event of Heavenly Mother and Heavenly Father, where they conceive a person in, into existence. In the, Brigham view, in the Brighamite view, um, I know that's an adjective you don't hear in mainstream Mormonism much, but um, it's a more fundamentalist uh, adjective. In the Brighamite view, the Brigham view, um, the Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother are from the stuff of intelligence um, initiating I don't want to say creating, but like organizing into existence the very beginning of an individual person. An ego identity, a self, begins at that uh, sexual event, that conception event. Um, so in the Joseph Smith view, a little bit uh, underdeveloped relative to later views, but it sounds like to him intelligence, intelligences, spirits, they're all they're synonymous. And in the, sorry to uh, long, uh, setting up the long question, um, in the view of B.H. Roberts, as I understand it, he s tries to synthesize the Smith view and the Brigham view, and that's where we have sort of the Talmadge popularized view today, that there were, are individual intelligences who are egos, identities, persons, individuals, who co-eternally and distinctly exist, but at the spirit begetting sexual event of Heavenly Mother, Heavenly Father, are enclosed with a spirit body. It's not that they have their beginning as a person, it's that they have uh, sort of the next stage of their existence evolving forward, uh, added upon with a spirit, uh, spiritual body, spirit body. So, whew, okay. And then I'll add one more little thing here. Yeah, Orson Pratt. Orson Pratt, as I understand him, believed that intelligence was reducible to the particles each of which is intelligent. Uh, I, I, I'm going to paraphrase this in a way that ways that might make some historians squirm, but it sounds like Pratt thought of the intelligences or the particles as like brain cells. Yeah, it's kind of like an Epicurean view. I think that he has. He he kind of takes the. I don't think he was aware. Maybe he was. Maybe I'm just underestimating him. It sounds like he takes the Epicurean theory of matter and applies it to intelligences. I think that's a import. That's a necessary. And a person, according to Pratt, as I understand him here weekly, is a kind of coalescing or a corporate person. It's like a the, the emergence of a singular, larger collective person because of sort of the 
the symbiosis of all the brain cells, if you will. So those are like different views. When you talked to me last time, uh, it sounded like you, you said that in, there's intelligence, the impersonal stuff, yes. and then there's intelligences, the individuals who are individual particles. Yeah. Anyway, I've just set that up with a long set up, but please, please respond. Yeah, yeah I think that there is um, individual intelligences that are the form of grass. So I think there is a bunch of grass intelligences out there. The, the view Did you say grass? Yeah, grass, like grass or like flowers or rocks. I think there are rock intelligences. The view I espouse is kind of a hodgepodge of Talmadge and then Skousen. Um, and then I think that there are individual intelligences that we are. So I think that we were formed as an intelligence that is exactly like within us, probably like yay big in our throats, personal theory, things in our throats. I take that from stoicism. Um, to be perfectly frank. Um, Did you derive that a little bit from an LDS view? A little bit, yeah. So I, I, I took it from, my sources would be a gospel trilogy, then anything written by Talbot John. And this is Cleon Skousen? Yeah, and, and he's he kind of like a disciple of Pratt. Uh, yeah, he's kind of a Prattian, but at the same time, he's a little bit weird. Um, he's a little bit more of a liminal figure. I wish he was more mainstream. Um, Talmadge, um, and then I would say Book of Abraham, because I also think that intelligences and spirits are the same shape, size sort of deal, but they're individual and unique to us. So persons yeah. have um, an individual particle in their throat, yeah. which is them. It's, it, it's, it's the self. Yes. And uh, when, you, when you told me this last time, I was like, whoa, 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 what? I've never heard this before. Um, so the self is an individual particle. That's the intelligence part of you, at least. Yeah. I, I imagine there's some sort of effort at like thinking of the the whole self as an integrated self um, where your body is now a part of you. But um, I, I kind of likened it though a little bit to uh, a, a pilot in a pilot seat, uh, in a pilot, in a, sorry, in a, in, a, in a plane, or a, a driver in a car, or I mentioned the men in black. Um, yeah. There's a movie where um, there's this human body that kind of gets opened up at some point and there's a little tiny alien figure in it controlling it. I'm not trying to be uh, I will be critical later in other ways, but I'm not. I'm, just, I'm trying to draw analogies to explain. It. Is that sort of the you piloting sort of your spacesuit? Um, like, uh, yeah. So, yeah, sure. I think that there's mind, there's spirit, there's body, and then there's intelligence. And I think the unification of all of those constitutes a soul. Um, and I'd say that the intelligence part of you is what drives agency. So that's. Where? So, so the agent uh, making agency decisions yes. is doing it from the throat. Sure. Yeah. 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 That's definitely not doctrine. Okay. But that is, but the, the part about body spirit being soul is doctrine, but not about the intelligence being in your throat. Uh, okay. We did mention last time. Uh, okay. So when I try to talk about the spiritual begetting event with other Latter-day Saints, I try to be typically euphemistic because there's a there's a kind of reaction, like an offense taken, if I say, um, well, I'll, I'll start with the euphemism. So I'll, I'll say things like, when Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, or some cases like one of his, you know, one of his, one of his wives, when they have a kind of male-female union event, when they're brought together and they bring together the spectrum of the, gen of the two genders, and then they work together in some sort of sexual way, meaning there's a bringing together of male and female, and they accomplish the conception, you were just like, well, let's just call it what it is. Like, Yeah, they just had sex. Um, I think that gender is eternal. I think that there are things that make you inherently male and inherently female. I think those things go beyond a biological spectrum, but I think the biological spectrum is important. Um, and I would say that the only unification event that can truly occur, um, the only event that I would consider actual sex is between male and a, a female during a marriage union. Um, and that marriage union exists into the eternities. So the, the use of, I'm not trying to be crass, but the use of their gendered body parts, um, compatible and then productive. Like. Exactly. And I think calling it sex or calling it procreation, um, I think using euphemisms, I don't know. I'm not a fan of using euphemisms because I don't think that that's what we actually believe. We believe in a very physical sense of godhood. Um, and the euphemisms don't quite cut it. Um, I think that a lot of the time we see sex as something that is inherently negative when it, is, it can be negative in particular contexts, right? So like, it's always positive in heteronormative marriage. Um, it's negative in every other, con every, other, uh, every other context, but within this context, it would then be inherently construed positively. So I'd say most Latter-day Saints should just say sex. 
So you see God as in a heteronormative marriage, and yeah. therefore, so it's for a classical Christian, sex is good within those heteronormative marital bounds, but it's a created good and a received good, whereas the creator is not himself in a marital relationship. So. Yeah, we believe that God is in a marital relationship. Um, plowing through, because we preempted a lot of this, who are some of your favorite modern Mormon authors? Um, and then a, oh, there we go. Um, I wonder how good the mic, I'm sure it's great. Um, I, I separately asked you who your favorite Mormon philosopher was. So more generically first, who, who are your favorite modern Mormon authors? Yeah, so my favorite author right now is actually Thomas Wayman. Um, I love everything that he writes. I think the New Testament translation was quite brilliant. Um, I like what a lot of what he has to say about Joseph Smith. I thought his newest paper, um, which covers the Clark commentary, is a really critical read, and I think it's a good step forward for understanding how intertextuality works within even religious texts. So I'm really a big fan of Thomas Wayman currently. Um, I'm a really big fan of, um, I guess, like, I like Mark Ellison a lot. He does a lot of early Christian stuff. He's in the ancient scripture department. I'm really fond of him. Um, I'm really fond of Blake Osler. Um, as a philosopher. As a philosopher, yeah. I would have to say Blake Osler, and I have some disagreements. He's more of an atheist. As you mentioned, he has an agape ethics sort of thing. I'm a virtue ethicist. Oh. And he's more of an open theist. Yes, he is. So I have disagreements with him, but I, I admire the work that he's doing because I don't see a lot of Latter-day Saints who do that. Um, my favorite philosopher, besides Blake, Blake Osler, I have to plug Spencer Marsh. I've read a lot of his stuff recently, and I think he's really great. So. Is this a plug for your friend? Yeah, it's a plug for my friend. But published? <laughs> he's published, yes. What, is it? what did he publish? So he published a thing in the Interpreter Foundation. You should give it a read. It's really good. What's he's, it about? Um, he's really brilliant. So this one, I think, is about the Book of Mormon. I think that's the one I'm referring to. But he's published a, a bunch of different things on the Internet. So. Okay. Um, and we're getting here toward the end of, of this direction of the interview. Um, McConkie. You said you were a McConkie fan. Why? Uh, yeah, why? So... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Brigham Young for a second, then I'll take us to McConkie. Um, I think Brigham Young and McConkie have a lot in common. I think they both espouse very unique philosophical ideas that help us to understand scripture in a different light. And I think the work that McConkie does is continuing the work that Brigham Young does, which is taking a higher and deeper approach to doctrine. And the reason I like McConkie so much is I think in Mormon doctrine, one of the things that he does is he provides a description of what it means to be a Latter-day and what it means to be a member of a religion and what our religion espouses. And I think that descriptivism is really important because I think a lot of the time we have prophets who are more devotional. And there's nothing wrong with devotions. I love devotions, but I think the descriptivism that McConkie does is really great. I also think we need more of a fire and brimstone approach at times. Um, so I'm fond of like early Holland as well, um, even mid-Holland. <laughs> mid he seems to be one of the few, um, uh, I mean, if it was in the 1950s, it sounds like he's the kind of guy who would pound his fist on the podium and make a, an, an accentuated, forceful point, that kind of thing. Yeah, but and also very underrated is President Oaks. I think President Oaks is absolutely brilliant. Um, I think he just lays out doctrine very succinctly, very clearly, and a lot of members of the church who don't agree with the ideas that he espouses becomes very offended, but I think it's really good that he says what is truth and he says it clearly. So it doesn't sound like you're very progressive as a Mormon in, in the in the main sense of that view, yeah. uh, or that word. Um, McConkie and Oaks, but thinking here of McConkie, blunt, bold, clear, art articulate, concise, um, doctrinal guardian, doctrinal expounder. I think he's an enemy of God. I think he's a heretic, of course, and I have a lot of critical things to say. But from an evangelical point of view, I kind of appreciated the putting things on the table mm -hmm. spirit. That I, We've appreciated the, the, book, the, uh, the book Mormon Doctrine, yeah. Not because it's like 100% representative of mainstream institutional yeah. cultural Mormonism, but it's a pretty good representation of sort of the Talmadge, Joseph Fielding Smith vein of sort of doctrinal guardianship and, and clarity. Um, whereas the devotional sort of direction that things took later on, it, it, it became harder to kind of pin things down. Um, and there were even to be sort of a movement among Latter-day Saint thinkers to become more ambivalent or equivocal or sort of sort of Stephen Robinson sort of step back and sort of hold out as possibly false some of the things that made Mormonism famous, some of the sort of the, the big thoughts of classical Mormonism, the, the ideas, well, maybe those things are false, maybe they're not official, maybe they're not true, maybe we can discard those, maybe they're not essential to religion, but 
Anyway, McConkie, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm babbling a little bit, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll respond to a little bit of that. Um, yeah, I would not describe myself as progressive um, in a political or religious sense. I don't think you could describe me as progressive. And what I would have to say about why I like people like McConkie and Oaks and Holland and even President Nelson can be quite conservative. And I'm not using that in a political sense, just lowercase c. Um, theologically. Yeah, theologically conservative. The reason I really like that is I think progressivism fails because it doesn't hold an author authoritarian structure it doesn't you don't ne necessarily need god within progressivism because everything becomes relative not just relative to a cosmic deity as i would have it be but relative to feelings or sensations and i think that that's where liberalism fails a lot of the time theological liberalism and i think people like oaks are very critical because the progressivism the the ultimate roots of progressivism in my mind are marxism because you have this idea that you can go beyond the boundaries that have been placed upon you uh, because those boundaries are inherently false and in order to do that you cannot have a god and you cannot have a religion because religion regulates and god regulates um, so that's why i would condemn a more progressive approach even pragmatically the people that who who espouse that we cannot know certain things that I think are definitely doctrinal, that the church says is, are doctrinal. I'll take family proclamation as an example. I would say that that's an example of apostasy because you're saying that the boundaries that have been clearly delineated in my view by God, and I know not in your view by God, but actually family proclamation would probably agree with most of it. A lot of ethical overlap. Yeah, a lot of ethical overlap. I would say that those boundaries that have been defined by God that are expressed through... Interrupting ironically here, we, we really like the monogamy part of it. Like, I'm, I'm being... Yeah. Cheeky, not ironic, but one male, one female. So I love monogamy too. I think. Oh, yeah, you say, okay. You say polygamy is nullified in the millennium. I just uh, wrecked your train of thought. So uh, please continue. It. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, cheeky comments are great. Um, but I would say that the family proclamation exists as doctrine, and progressing beyond that is destroying the foundations of Christianity. It's destroying the foundations of Scripture. It's destroying the foundations of what is good and evil as expressed by God, but also as is internalized by God and as exists because of God's expression of it. Um, so, so we had to change out the battery. Uh, we're talking about progressivism. It sounds like, if I'm restating your view correctly, that the spirit of LDS progressivis progressivism really is resistant and perhaps rebellious against authority structure, or the, the spirit of authority, um, uh, God regulating, telling you, restricting you, directing you. Um, so this is not on the list, but how do you navigate? I, 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 to be honest, in my yeah. experience, among Latter-day Saints that really go deep in the doctrinal stuff, the history stuff, they just bend left so quick. They, they progressive and theologically... And so it, it's kind of neat to meet like a, a Latter-day Saint that's just sort of overtly, boldly a traditionalist, I'll say that, um, sold on the authority claims. Not because I think that's good or right, but in, in some sense, it's like if you're going to be a religion, then be the religion. Like if, if you're going to hold to the claims, hold to the claims. Why? Like uh, when you about Christianity, I think. Uh, Christianity isn't moderately important. You go all in or you don't go at all. Like, it's, you're sold out. Um, you sell everything you have, that kind of spirit, you, you, you go all in. Anyway, so how do you navigate that in your community? Um, there's a premise I'm operating off of here, yeah. which maybe you can attenuate. Um, I think you're correct. The, the premise is, is that in the academic community, um, at least among peers, you're in a sea of progressive fish yes. that might take offense to what you hold, uh, especially with gender and sexuality stuff. So it sounds like you take a tradi traditionalist LDS view of, of, of the structure of marriage, the, the structure of sexuality. Um, yeah, how do you navigate that? Because it's like, when I think about my Latter-day Saint acquaintances and friends and coworkers, it's like, oh my goodness, they're, uh, they seem to be not in agreement with the Latter-day leadership on marriage and sexuality. Um, and they seem to have a looser view of authority um, and a looser view of scripture, like... Uh, Book of Abraham is expendable, might not be true. Um, uh, yeah. uh, King Follett discourse isn't official, might be wrong. Um, by the way, we never mentioned Sermon in the Grove. Oh, that's actually a bullet point forthcoming. Oh, so, well, okay. I'll, 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 I'm babbling again, but how do you navigate being a, a, a LDS, an LDS traditionalist in a, in a progressive ethos in modern Mormon community? I think that's a really interesting question. That's something that I've definitely received a lot of pushback for, I think more so than anything. I've written pretty publicly for the Salt Lake Tribune and I've received 
a ton of pushback for saying that I like Brigham Young and I think he's a prophet. Um, and I've also written about sexual ethics and mores and how we need to keep those traditional. Um, I would say my personal navigation is I personally do not care about taking gender theory and I do not care about taking post-colonialism and Marxism and trying to apply them to my faith and I think that's what progressivism inherently has to do because you cannot read that from the text of the Bible. Um, if we're even just talking about the Bible, we're not talking about the Book of Mormon or any other doctrine, um, though I would say that if you think the Book of Abraham is ahistorical, if you think the, the, the Book of Mormon is ahistorical, I don't think that you could really maintain membership in the church. You have to Long term. Join the Church of Christ, like uh, the Community of Christ, the sorry, sort of the, yeah. the liberal sort yeah. of the, I call it, like the United Methodists of Mormonism. Exactly, yeah. So I would say that. Um, sorry, the the liberal wing of United Methodists, the ones that you ask, did Jesus rise from the dead? And they're like, I don't know. I, I remember asking a, yeah. a COC or RLDS tour guide in Nauvoo. Um, so do you believe in heaven and hell? And she was like, I don't know. That's an interesting question. And like. So, I mean, she was like a really, she was really invested in the history. But anyway, so yeah. please continue your thought, uh, please. Yeah, I think you would have to take external theories and apply them to the Bible um, in order to come up with those views. So I just reject that wholesale because I don't think that that's a valid way to read scripture. I don't think that's a valid way to come to truth. I think truth manifests itself through study. Um, and I would say like on a personal note for how I navigate it, I honestly just don't care what other people think. Okay. Um, I care what... I think God thinks of me and what God has revealed to me about his opinion for me and I care about how it corroborates against scripture and if you're gonna stand for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints you might as well stand for all of it or none of it. it either either you stand for what the prophets and apostles have said and err on the side of being too conservative which I don't think will get you condemned I don't think I'll be condemned if I say something that is a little bit too conservative because I'm agreeing with something that Joseph Smith said or that Orson Pratt said but I think you become condemned once you go beyond the boundaries of doctrine. I think that that's when you lose your faith. So, and it sounds like your definition of doctrine is robust or it's, it's broad, whereas a minimalist view, a progressive LDS approach, it sounds like they minimize the, the category of doctrine down to sort of like a, like a really small subset of what has been publicly portrayed as revelation. See, I, I even disagree with that. I don't even think the progressives can do that because if the progressives would do that, then they would have to hold family proclamation as doctrine. Well, they would say not all first presidency statements are doctrinal. Uh, certain, for certain first presidency statements of the 19th century by Brigham have been sort of discarded as uh, false or but that, that one's not just a first presidency statement. That one's ratified and upheld. So I would say that the progressive view is really tenuous and just logically inconsistent because basically what they do is they try to suggest that um, one claim that I've heard especially recently is that Brigham Young isn't a prophet because he said racist things. Um, that's been one claim that I've heard. Not a prophet at all? Uh, that's one claim I've heard pretty consistently. Like you can go online and just Google so Brigham Young. I agree with that, especially because he did that stuff in the name of God. But from a Latter-day Saint perspective, it seems like you have to hold on to the core of what his public teachings were in order to like respect the category of it being a true prophet. And in order not to like reduce the category of prophet down to almost nothing, you can't throw him under the bus. Like, I won't throw Brigham Young under the bus. I'll say that there are things that he said that I don't think are true, um, but I won't say that he was a deeply flawed person. I would say in the same way that you have other other Christian leaders who did things that are equal or much worse to what Brigham Young did, but we still revere them for the good things that they did. So I think it's a good bad matrix in which Brigham Young did more good than he did bad, but I think completely disqualifying him as a prophet is wrong. And I would say I would I would rather err on the side of defending Brigham Young wholesale than I would err on the side of not defending Brigham Young at all, because I don't think that that's a tenuous position to hold as a Latter-day Saint. And anyone who says that we need to completely condemn Brigham Young, I would say, isn't really a believer in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Lots to say, lots to respond to, lots to critique, but um, yeah. going down the... the so uh, you previously mentioned King Fault Discourse, doctrinal, 100% yes, um, doctrinal. Sermon in the Grove, this is helpful to, to tell our watchers, hearers here. The Sermon in the Grove is a, as a speech, a sermon given subsequent to the King Fault Discourse, where Smith uses Revelation 1.6, the King James Version, not the JST. He sort of reverts, he implicitly decides that the JST was... It wasn't finished. Uh, I'll just be blunt as an evangelical critic. It sounds like... Uh, he thinks that the JST 
of 1.6, as he corrected it, as it stood in, in that moment, was wrong. And he reverted back to the King James rendering, which had a kind of awkward wording, which made it sound like the father could have a father. So in the Sermon in the Grove, he argues that every father has a son, every son has a father, and extrapolates essentially that there's an infinite regress. He doesn't use the word infinite, but you extrapolate there's an endless regress uh, of ancestral deities um, of one eternal round. We've kind of covered this, yeah, but, yeah. but you, you hold the Sermon in the Grove to be uh, either doctrinal or representative of, of doctrine? Yeah, so I would say it's doctrinal. I would say it's not canonical, but it teaches ideas that are logically construed from what we consider doctrine in the Kinfolic discourse. The ideas expressed in there would be logically considered doctrine because of what we define. So I would say it's okay. easy to just call it doctrinal. So it's not canon and it doesn't have the same kind of authority as canon. Uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but because it's consistent with canon and because it's a prophetic, in some sense prophetic, yeah. confirmation. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, he's, Smith here is he speaking as a prophet, would you say? Or? Yeah, I would say he's speaking as a prophet. Take it. It's 100% true in my opinion. So this is where Latter-day Saint uh, stinkers like Brigham got heavenly grandfather, uh, not by that term, but by that concept. Okay. Yeah, and I think that that's really important for most Latter-day Saints to take and to incorporate into their faith because I think that that is... I think exaltation and our infinite regress of gods differentiates us from traditional Christianity. I think we have a lot of the same ethics okay. as traditional Christians, but I think that unique teaching um, is a really important hinge um, for what makes our faith our faith, as opposed to being uh, like a member of Community of Christ or being FLDS or whatever. This is totally out of context for where we're at right now, but I remember a Christian leader saying um, with about Mormons, we won't go to church together, but we will go to jail together. Yeah. And he was referring to like a, a general defense of a, ju a historic Judeo-Christian ethic, especially on marriage and like oh, that. Um, and I, I, I felt like that was loosened in the last five, 10 years where I wasn't confident anymore that my Latter-day Saint neighbors were on that boat anymore. Like I, I just was like, oh, I, I don't think they would. I, I, I mean, I'm not trying to be snide or, or, or critical but it, it, uh, I'll be critical elsewhere but um, so to me traditionalism is like a, sort of like becoming more rare uh, sure. uh, even on ethics stuff but I, that, I, that, from from Sermon in the Grove and Re Re Revelation 1 6 it's off topic but uh, the definition of doctrine so the last two items for this direction of it uh, we've kind of touched this already yeah. um, Doctrine seems like it has different defini definitions. Sometimes it's just this general idea of unchanging truth revealed by prophetic figures. Yeah, an eternal truth versus a teaching. Whereas doctrine elsewhere used by Latter-day Saints, see, it's, it's uh, criticism leaking out more explicitly to come later. But like, it seems like sometimes Latter-day Saints are falling back on a foundation of plausible deniability. Falling back on layers of plausible deniability sort of restricting the scope or the, the size of the target at which outsiders can critique. So when someone says, XYZ was taught by a Joseph Smith, a uh, sermon in the Grove, King Fault Discourse, Stephen Robinson says, that's not official. And so it's like, it might be true, but it's not official. It might be publicly taught, but it's not official. It might be expected that people believe it, but it's not official. And so by that kind of rhetoric, I get the sense that official in that sense means it's the kind of truth that we publicly confess in a binding and uh, unescapable way. There's no like dodging, matrix dodging. It's like, uh, no, that's a part of our public prof uh, confession. Sure. And if we're gonna be, we're gonna have a target on us for believing that, well, let's make the target clear. Um, uh, but the minimalism of that of official doctrine standard is to like take the target and then make it the size of a dime. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that done. Whereas the traditionalism view is like, well, let's just keep the target as big as we possibly can with a high view of prophets and their prophetic teachings. So I'm kind of setting that all up to what the heck is official doctrine? So. For me, official doctrine, I probably have a different perspective on this than most people. Anything that the church teaches consistently is official doctrine. I think most prophetic statements are official doctrine. I would rather take what the prophets and apostles say today and consider it doctrine and defend it with my life than I would just say, oh, it's not official, I don't need to defend it. So I err on a larger side of what I consider doctrine, um, and I think that that's a more effective path to do it. So what is taught consistently? 
That sounds like a truism or a rule of thumb. It sounds like it ends up having to be nuanced. It, it, uh, sure. There, there are certain things that have been consistently taught that are no longer doctrine. Uh, things that were consistently taught that are no longer. Uh, yeah, what, what do you do with um, things that Latter-day Saint prophets have looked back that prior leaders have taught and said that, like McConkie says, you know, these are the seven deadly heresies. Sure. Um, would you, in your thinking, end up nuancing this official doctrine category to sort of tighten it up? And so there's the, there's sort of the yeah. rule of thumb definition, but do you have sort of a... I have a nuanced definition, yeah. I would say modern prophets supersede things for me. So like what a modern prophet tells me today supersedes what prophets told me in the past. So I would say the prophets that are around me are the most important. I would say scripture is also the most important. I would consider scripture a little more import, important than modern prophets, but modern prophets help us understand scripture. So I, if I had to do kind of a hierarchy, I would take what corroborates in the scripture, what's what's the canon. Um, then I would take modern prophets and apostles. Then I would take past prophets and apostles. And then I, I would take, um, I would take just, um, things that corroborate with the aforementioned three. So that's kind of the hierarchy that I hold, um, and that's how you determine consistency. But yeah. I would say I would rather stand with the modern prophets and apostles and what they teach than fall with. So something like the Word of Wisdom. I read the DNC 86, and it's yeah. like, if the canon is the highest source of authority and it can't be contradicted, then by that standard, beer is encouraged. Um, the, the section is not by way of commandment. Um, principle given with a promise. I would say that the word of wisdom, though, has been understood since the time of Woodruff to be more of a doctrinal mandate. It's a part of the Temple Recommend questions. And because it's a part of the Temple Recommend questions, which are designed and approved upon by the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the First Presidency, which have been updated within the last couple of years, I think it was 2018, right? Um, I, I would say that because that is a requirement, then we must consider the word of wisdom doctrine. It is not just a principle, it is definitely a commandment. Okay, so I'm trying to tease this out. Um, yeah. You, 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 in your description, you put the canon on top, and then the, lead, the modern leaders underneath the canon. Sure. But it sounds like you would you would take certain teachings of the modern leaders over and against the canon yeah. if necessary. So if, if there's a consistent teaching of the modern leadership, um, that would potentially be that would supersede the teachings of the canon. Is that sure. okay. yes? So I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, aggressively in, inter uh, interrogated here. Again, that's fine for a different context, but are you putting modern prophets above the canon or the canon above modern prophets? The canon above modern prophets, but if modern prophets, all, like if the first presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles all said something, all said the same thing, that superseded the canon, then I would take that. Okay. But the canon is generally the highest principle for me. I think that's it. So what I'll do here is I'll, I'll read out what I have as my notes for the other direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, I invited you in a prior discussion. Uh, interrogate the other direction. and. and yeah, um, yeah. So uh, oh, I have actually I have a question. I want to talk about biblical literacy. Awesome. Uh, up front, though, let me say uh, the flexibility with which I went through my notes. Please feel free to use that same degree of flexibility. Perfect. Um, so uh, do you want to start with what you have in mind or you want me to go down the list? Well, let's go down the list. Yeah. OK. I'll work it in. OK. Sorry. Um, you asked me uh, everything predestined, question mark. Uh, and then we talk about secondary causes. You want to uh, ask that in your own way? Yeah, sure. So I would say um, what I understand of your view is basically, I'm just trying to do the same thing that you did. What I understand of your view is that you believe that God has determined everything, but there is the will of man to act as a free agent at the same time. Um, and I think that that's an important distinction. So things, evil exists as a secondary cause to good. Um, so I would say then, how did God not cause evil directly um, because right so because God created good and then evil exists as a secondary cause to that how do you remove the agency from God I, 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 that's yeah I that's a good way to ask it how do you remove the agency from God in that instance how does God then not become culpable even though it is a secondary cause because I think you can be culpable for things that you set into motion so so it a um, couple answers one is it seems like the philosophical difficulty is how can there be ultimately a moral distinction sure. between the primary cause and the secondary causes that are downstream from the primary cause? Yes. The, the upfront, sort of chi hopefully childlike answer I have is I don't know, um, is that the, the posture I'm trying to take under scripture is I want to agree with all the parts of scripture, harmonize, harmonize, 
it as best as I can. And even if, even if it's like untenable to philosophy department, okay, that's fine. Um, so how are they compatible? How is the, the genuine will of man, the moral culpability of, of a free agent of a man, um, compatible with God as the primary cause? Um, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know how those two things fit together. I just put them together as a confession from different scriptures. The other answer is, it seems like Paul in Romans 9, yeah. uh, he's work. It, it sounds like when he's writing this letter to the, to the Romans, it sounds like he's, he's been through the ringer already, uh, having a kind of back and forth with a Jewish audience, or maybe a, a Greek audience also, who are raising objections to his main points. And so he anticipates objections uh, he preempts them. Uh, you will say to me then, that kind of thing. Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? By no means, he says in Romans 6. In Romans 9, when he talks about the election of, of uh, Jacob and Esau, um, he talks about the hardening of Pharaoh. He, he voices sort of on behalf of a crit critic, um, how could God blame us for who can resist his will? And I take those two parts. Um, he still blames us. He still holds us morally culpable, accountable. And yet his ultimate will, especially his, his electing will, um, is uh, irresistible. It's unstoppable. Um, how could God blame us for who can resist his will? And he, what the answer he gives is, well, who are you, a man, to talk back to God? Uh, he's the potter, you're the clay. You know, there's a certain way a clay shouldn't talk back to the potter. So that's a kind of a, an attitude or a posture. And he doesn't really give a philosophical answer except to say, what if God has decided to, I'm paraphrasing here, to show the whole panorama of God's glory, his justice and his mercy. He puts like the, the virtues of God's justice and mercy ultimately uh, decides to have them both shown in redemptive history through election, through an irresistible will, and yet through genuine moral culpability. What if God is sort of like putting this whole picture together um, to put those things on display? Anyway, so the short answer is I don't know, but scripturally I see good reason to believe both things. So. Sure, and I kind of want to press you a little bit on scriptural authority. I think this is a good place to do it. So, um, as I understand it, the Hebrew Bible, the Greek Bible, they were compiled after the fact. Um, they were canonized after the fact. So there were certain books that didn't make it into the canon. There were super, certain epistles that we know that were written by Paul that we don't have. Letter of Tears is another is a good example of that. Like a third letter to the, to the yeah. Corinthians. Yeah, exactly. So we don't have certain um, certain apostolic documents. So then this this canon was determined um, by Catholic lowercase C um, church. Um, how then do you consider that prophetic? What what about the canon makes it special? Um, let me babble for a minute to see if I'm yeah. like responding. Tell, tell me if I'm addressing it adequately. I take scripture to be inspired upon its authorship. Okay. So it, it's not, there's no bequeathing or adding or tagging extra authority. Um, by the way, um, I, I can, I'm not, I, when, when you hold the microphone, there's a kind of cadence to back and forth. So I don't want to be like, um, but, Maybe give me a, a, a non verbal cue and I'll just I'll bring it back. So yeah, I'm actually going to ask you a question. Yeah. Is Paul an apostle? Yeah. Uppercase A or lowercase A? As one untimely born. But yeah, among the, the, the big, the, the, among the short list of apostles. Sure, okay. Keep going then. Yeah, uh, again, verbal cue if you need me to bring it back over. Sorry, I got the. Um, um, so scripture is inspired upon inspiration, it, upon authorship. It has a, a dual authorship of man and God and a single unified voice. And its authority is inherent to it. Uh, because, because God said it, it's, it has its own authority. That is its own, um, uh, it, it should be received as authoritative. So I take a formal canonization event as a receiving and a recognition of what it already is. Uh, it, it's not, it's not, it, it, it's as though, it's as though, uh, a judge meets a couple that's already common law married and then and just sort of like says, oh, these guys are married. This guy and this gal, guy and this gal are married. Um, uh, so the, I don't think any councils added or bequeathed any authority on any books of the Bible, nor do they add inspiration. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so then I would say then how do you deal with the, like the book of Genesis, right? Where right now we're seeing that um, scholarship is telling us, I have, I'm definitely a partial to German scholarship on this. Um, we're seeing that there's a potential for multiple op authorship. We don't necessarily think that it's written by Moses. We're seeing that with a lot of different books that we think that they're written by different people who did not necessarily have prophetic and apostolic authority. So then how do you 
then reconcile that? Do you just take the tradition of what it says? Or do you analyze how there seems to be things in Genesis that are written in a different tone and a different style that would render them of a different author, or even in Luke? Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, I'm going to take a more traditional conservative Protestant view of authorship. I'm going to say Moses is the author of Genesis. Um, that doesn't preclude him incorporating some existing sort of patterns of literature in order to make a sort of polemical point. Um, so I'm going to be more vigilant to take a more traditional view of authorship. Um, I don't think that scripture in the New Testament, for example, had to be written by an actual apost uh, okay, apostle. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then I would say, with respect to transmission, then how do you reconcile transmission, right? Because it's kind of a platonic form idea, but the scriptures that we have, well, while it's nice to have them in, in English, it's nice to have them on sheets of paper that you can just open and they're organized, they weren't that way in the original form. We don't have the first copy of the Gospels. So then I find, for me, scripture alone is kind of a hard position to reconcile because we don't know exactly what the form of them would be. Um, so could you expand a little bit about how you then try to take these documents that have been transmitted? And I'm not saying that they're wildly erroneous, but like there's definitely there's yeah. definitely going to be some changes that we have we have hashed out through scholarship and some changes that we're probably not aware of too. This is where I think maybe conservative, theologically conservative Latter-day Saints and theologically conservative evangelicals. Uh, by the way, side note on the critical theory Marxism stuff. Um, I think that's a potential for productive dialogue between Latter-day Saints yeah. and evangelicals who are jointly, and I actually think some atheists uh, as well. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely some atheists who have really good thinking on that. Where we could uh, uh, co-belligerently oppose uh, that kind of uh, movement. Um, but um, going back to, so back to uh, uh, transmission. I, I, my hope is that in decades to come, among at least conservative Latter-day Saints, theologically, and conservative evangelicals, theologically, there, we could come to a more of a convergence that uh, we ought not have a kind of f fatal view of the transmission of the New Testament, at least, okay. uh, where uh, there were conspiracies and priests that were like wholesale removing books and yeah, yeah, uh, sort of either. monkeying with large sections. Um, the, so in, in practice, what this looks like is that when I pick up a modern English New Testament, if there are any variants that might have any potential impact, there's a footnote for it. And so the, the categories that Daniel Wallace gives me are super helpful. Among the variants, hundreds of thousands of variants, the more Greek manuscript evidence you have, the more it multiplies variants uh, that you can count. But uh, the, the variants that matter between in the manuscript history, uh, there's, the categories are meaningful and viable. Meaningful means it actually changes the meaning of the text. Viable means it's, a, it's a, an actual contender for a, a reconstructed original reading of the text. That when scholars look at the sort of the family tree of the, of the manuscripts, they say, aha, that actually might be in the live pool of plausible options for the original reading of the text. Um, so you might have a meaningful change that's like totally not the original, and you might have a, a, a plausible reading that's a contender for uh, a viable or original reading that, that has no meaningful change on the meaning of the text. Sure, yeah. I had a third category of interesting. Uh, so even if it's like meaningful, uh, is it interesting, doctrinally interesting? So what, I, what I've heard from Daniel Wallace is that when you compare the meaningful and viable, when you, when you, when you, re when you take the list and you reduce it down to the meaningful and viable textual variants, it get, the list gets really short. And, and the list that I say a Bart Ehrman critic would have and a Daniel Wallace evangelical scholar would have, the, the difference um, it ends up being a few dozen passages. Sure. So, at least within the New Testament, much right. larger within the Hebrew Bible, but the New Testament yeah. we have as to attestations in the first century. So, yeah. So I, I think the the big three exceptions to this are John eight, the woman caught in adultery. I don't think that's uh, the original. I think it's Luke, right? I think that would be in Luke originally. So you're saying it's like included in Luke, Luke and manuscripts, and then sort of got stuck into the John eight. That's my view of it. I think it's original, but I think it's originally in Luke. It sounds like a faithful Jesus story, but I'm not confident enough to treat it like canon. Or sure, yeah. yeah. So it, honestly, when I've had faithful pastors go through the Book of John, they literally have skipped over the over it. Oh, fascinating! Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So I, it, and you'll see in modern English translations, this is not found in the earliest manuscripts. Yeah. There's uh, the long ending of Mark, the last paragraph, big paragraph of Mark, yeah. where it sounds like the the mic drop of the women uh, running away afraid. Uh, you know, Mark is totally a dramatic guy. Uh, 
who loves to just go from scene to dramatic scene yeah, with dramatic the, mic drops. Yeah, the ethos that immediately every five seconds or all of a sudden, depending on your translation. Yeah. <laughs> so it, to it honestly sounds like a, a bunch of, uh, th they've made a script for um, a bunch of theatric Christians so that when they get together for their home fellowship, um, they're performing the Gospel of Mark. Yeah. But when you get to the end of the Gospel of Mark, there's this really awkward mic drop where the women went away f afraid. And it's like, it's being, it, it, the story is not like, well, I guess Jesus wasn't resurrected. It just, you sort of fill in the gaps with, with, with the rest of the Christian message. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work meant to be perhaps performed. It sounds like there were some scribes that were like, oh man, this is so awkward. And so they filled in yeah. the last bit of Mark with things that were already in the book of Acts. Sure, yeah. So it doesn't sound like it doctrinally changes anything, um, but that's a really clear example. And then the third example is, I think it's called the Johannine comma, 1 yeah. John 5, 7 or 8, where um, water, blood, and spirit are changed to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so um, it, this is not among the, this, not, this was not a Trinitarian proof text uh, uh, that was used by early Trinitarians. It was never needed to, argue for the trinity um but it was la later so if you take those three editions um I, I think those are the serious ones what the the sad thing is i think critics put out those three examples as though illustrative of other corruptions where i really think there's just the big three and the other things the other things become uh less interesting really quickly um also those are additions uh, i think you can construct the entirety of the new testament that was original uh today I don't think there's anything missing. Zero words, zero verses. I think the, the, the biggest corruptions we've had are those three additions, and we've got uh, meaningful and viable variants. But I don't think I think uh, I, I don't think we're when you look at, when you collect the manuscript evidence collectively, I don't think we're missing anything. So that's interesting. I, w I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't say that we're missing verses, but I would leave room for missing a couple words. I think that just happens because they did they would leave out words within Greek. So I think that that they just naturally left out certain words. Um, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought. If, or, or, if or, I could give like a spirited uh, help, like when I think about a door opening to sure. a room that's dark, and there's no other size, source of light, and you open the door 90% um, of the way, yeah, yeah. the light comes in so powerfully that you can see everything in the room. Yeah, sure. I, I see that point. Yeah. I, if, I'm definitely yeah. not of the opinion that the New Testament is wildly corrupt. I think it's mostly reconstructable. The Hebrew Bible, I think we have a bit more problems just because it's older, but not... I don't think that's wildly wrong either. Uh, for a different discussion, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. Or my next questions. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. Um, submission to scripture. Yeah. Mystery of compatibilism. Okay. Maintaining purity and responsibility. That's okay. God's purity. That's yeah. got his, his, how could God be holy and, and then uh, predestined all that comes to pass and yet not be morally culpable? Yeah, I think we touched on that a little bit already. Um, and the brief answer is I don't know. Yeah. It seems scriptural. Uh, uh, one really interesting thing to me is that in Romans, repeatedly, Paul makes the point that God intended to increase sin, to increase transgression um, in the Jewish people by giving them the law. Sure, yeah. And it becomes an, an example of me how God can act in purity. He basically just tells a, a group of people, don't lie, don't murder, don't covet. And Romans 7 describes our flesh's encounter with the law that says do not covet, that kind of thing. Um, our flesh, uh, our sinful nature, is, is, um, it takes advantage of that and it, 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 it provokes itself to more sin. Yeah. So what does God have to do to get someone to sin more? He has to tell them not to sin. Sure. And so God can be holy. And that, that to me is just illustrative. If God can do that, I, want, I put a question mark. I wonder what other mechanisms that he can act in, in purity and in holiness. And somehow his relationship with time is that of declaration. Uh, he, he decides and declares what shall come to pass. And well, how does that, how do, how do the means to the end actually work out? I, I don't know, it's a mi philosophical mystery. You asked me earlier about why preach the gospel if yeah. all of that's true. Yeah, so. no. So um, I, I think just to kind of summarize from what I've seen, what your view is, um, if you're an evangelical, you were predestined to be an evangelical. If you're a Latter-day Saint like me, you were predestined to be a lot. At least today. Yes. Right. Um, Quaker, Quaker asked me that in the debate, and I, I totally regret the way I responded to that. Cause you said, I, every, you oh. said every horrible sin of the Latter-day Church was 
predestined. Uh, yeah, well, I think everything's been predestined. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and so... But I, I kind of looked at the audience, and I was like, I had this sense that, like, a lot of the people that I know that are Latter-day Saints, they, they, they're, on, they're in transition already out. And so they get religiously burnt out. And um, I talk to a lot of people on the street who are ex-Mormon. You here in Provo. Yeah, yeah. Sort of, a lot of ex-Mormon. Ton, like, countercultural, yeah, okay. rugged atheist, ex-Mormon, burnout. And it's like, we're trying to teach the gospel to them. And they're just sort of done with religion. And so I've just got this sense of, like, oh, man, I, I deal with, like, Latter-day Saints. And I deal with, like, burnouts. Who, who like want nothing to do with Jesus or the Bible, and so that's sort of the spirit of anyway. That's total a detour yeah. of what you're asking, but yeah, no, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna make the point that like because it's predestined, it can't be changed. There's still the will of right. man involved. Um, I've seen stuff about that from evangelicals, and I, I totally believe that. But for me, it's kind of hard to reconcile the 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 effect of preaching the gospel upon someone that's predestined. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, and the response I gave last time was. Um, uh, God has ordained and pre- I say, when I say ordained I, I basically mean predetermined sure. both the means and the ends so if he has uh, predestined me to become a Christian he has predestined the means by which I become a Christian sure. so when I look at Utah I see really hard soil it's a desert uh, but I see a lot of like stubborn religionists and stubborn atheists and stubborn progressives and it's like you know who am I to like preach anything to them and expect any results. And so the, the confidence I have as a Calvinist is, well, God has ordained and predestined to draw effectively and absolutely and securely a people to himself. He, he will keep his promise to Abraham to make a, 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 you know, to a great nation, of, to, how does it put, like, to basically draw people from every tribe, telling a nation, he elsewhere says, uh, to make a great people through him. He's going to accomplish that with certainty. And so for me, preaching the gospel is participating in the means by which God has predestined to achieve the ends he has predestined. So it actually like encourages me to preach more, be less discouraged. Um, like uh, God's going to draw people to himself. He's, what is he up to with COVID-19 and social unrest? Like, like I, I feel like 2020 is a massive case of like, what is God up to? What, what is he orchestrating? What, what is he affecting for the good of the people that he'll draw to himself? What kind of tragedies are, is he predestining? to uh, soften people's hearts and draw people to him and win them over to himself and and make them voluntary believing. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sorry for the long answer, but it, no, it's like predestination for me fills in the gaps because it's like, okay, God's going to use evangelism and the preaching of the word to save people through that. Um, not in spite of that, not, not apart from that, but through that, a means to the end. So. Yeah, I have one last question. It's oh, probably yeah. going to be kind of unexpected. Yeah. Favorite verse in the Book of Mormon? Uh, Moroni 8.18. Okay. For we know that God is not a partial God, neither a changeable being, but he is unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. So. I see why you like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had other stuff that, true. if you want, you don't, you don't have to. Um, um, I, yeah. The, the fun stuff that we sort of ended on last time that was kind of fun yeah, was, was translations. Favorite oh, translation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah, let's do that. That was fun. So I'll start with you. Like, if you're not going to use the King James out of circumstance, sure, what would sure. you use? Yeah, if I'm not going to use the King James, I love the New International Version. Yeah. I'll, I will say I don't really read the English that much anymore, to be perfectly frank. Um, but I love the New International Version. I love the New Revised Standard Version. Um, I do like William Tyndale, ironically. Um, I really like it. I don't know. How about you? What's your favorite translation? My default is the English Standard Version, and I, um, but if I'm in a Bible study with six different versions, we delight in it because it's like helping us get different angles, different levels of specificity, yeah. different friendly, accessible wording. So something like the NIV, the NLT might be helpful at some level, but there's also the ESV, yeah. NASB is going to be more wooden, CSB tries to you know uh, have a good balance. So I. I like all those. Uh, any major modern English translation um, is redeemable to me. It's it's sure. beautiful. Yeah. yeah, major modern English translations, I think things like the Jehovah's Witness translation Bible or the, or the Good News can be a little iffy. But, um, yeah. Yeah. If it's done by a single person, like the message, sure. uh, that's harder to defend. That's, that's yeah. harder to, to uh, lean on. Sure. But if it's done by a committee of people, especially who represent sort of a broad spectrum, yeah. 
then it, typically it just turns out really well. I agree. Um, one question that I, I think I asked you this last time a little bit, um, do you think it's important as a Christian to try to learn Greek and Hebrew, especially if you're sola scriptura? For me, like I, I kind of compared it to the Quran last time too. So the Quran, as you know, in the original language is called the Quran, but any translation of it is inherently called the translation of the Quran, not the Quran. And that's kind of how I view my scriptures, if that makes sense. I like to look at them in the language that they were written in and see the translation as an interpretation of the original language. And it can be a valid and good interpretation, but I think there's a lot to be gained from that. Um, as someone who is by scripture alone, what do, you, what do you think about that point? Yeah, so I think English translations, translations are like opening that door. Sure. Uh, so the light comes in and you, the door comes open 99%. Yeah. And you're like, well, wouldn't the room be more like navigatable if one more percent was of light was brought in? Maybe, but we're doing pretty well at that do point. Think, do you think it's a 1% difference? Uh, I'm... I would say it's closer to like 5 to 10. That's why I bring it up because I feel like there's a lot to be there's a lot to be gained from understanding it according to your own language too, right? Because yeah. the, the, the the downside of English translations, in my opinion too, is you kind of have to look at the year that they were translated in and use a dictionary to determine sure. the definition of that word at the time, and that can be kind of transient too. Which seems like a, a reason for the them to be constantly updated with modern. Uh, yes, and I, I agree with yeah. that. I think modern translations are great, but so. The simple answer to your question is, because God inspired and breathed out the Hebrew and the Greek, um, a good seminary education or a good Christian nerd foundation uh, would be to pursue knowledge of Greek and Hebrew. So for me, um, I'm going to try to go to seminary this yeah. the August. Uh, uh, it would be insane not to pursue Greek and Hebrew. Um, and even if I can't go to seminary, even if somebody, like, I think they can learn the alphabet, you can learn a pronunciation scheme, you can um, uh, try to learn some basics enough where you can do some software. There's some interlinear, um, yep. yeah, Bible hub, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and, and, there, and it, people get a little carried away with word study fallacies at some points, but yeah. um, where they kind of pack things in when they shouldn't. But um, yeah, so the short answer is I want to do Greek. I've been doing conversational Greek online. I've been doing informal Greek for quite some time so yeah that's really great uh, I know you're a Greek nerd too yes, um, I love Greek. so all right um, if you want um, anything there Wait, book of Mormon copy pasta <laughs> that's, that's my that's my um, yeah yes I don't know how this came up in our conversation but I ended up making the point that it seems like Smith imbibed internalized the language of the king james oh yeah we talked about we did talk about that yeah um and i said that he didn't internalize the language of the king james and that's just the language. god's way of contextualizing the english for his uh, contemporaries yeah because i don't think joseph smith wrote the, okay. the book of mormon which i think is the critical hinging point on this so, i don't think joseph smith is actually smart enough um as someone who didn't learn to read oh. that Man, i look at the sum total of smith and i think he's brilliant so I think he became brilliant later in life. Was it Harold Bloom that said he was a religious genius? Yeah, I mean... Uh, Charismatic? Oh, man. I th I at think, a human level, yeah. I think at a human level, he was definitely very charismatic, but I don't think he was all that intelligent until he started to learn how to read and he started to learn Hebrew. Because, right, his reading level, I, th I thought it was estimated to not be that high, right? Didn't his own wife say that he could barely read beyond the age of, like, 12 and 13-year-old level reading comprehension? But from an outsider's perspective, and I don't have any pre-existing commitment to the Book of Mormon, when I read it, and this is just not trying to be snide at all, sure. it sounds like rambling. It does sound like somebody's orating, and it sounds like somebody is sort of, like, um, trying to sort of use the rhythmic sort of cadence and language and phraseology of the King James Bible. Just a little insert here. As I understand some modern developments, uh, not Cleon Skousen, but mo uh, Royal Skousen, as I understand it, has taken the position that the Book of Mormon was translated into English uh, um, in the, is it the early Reformation era, yeah. in, early, in early modern English. And as I understand it, uh, the view here is that when Smith dictated the Book of Mormon through the devices, the seer stones, he's, he's essentially dictating phrases that are in English that were already translated into English by another person or persons hundreds of years prior. 
So that's his way of sort of like um, maintaining, I think, the, the, the primary accounts of how, how the early quote unquote translation went down. And whereas other Mormon scholars, as I understand it, take the view that Smith is more participatory. He's using more of his own mental model. Um, he's more of a co-participant in sort of the flexible usage of modern English language. Anyway, I just think that's fascinating. I think uh, modern Mormons should know about it. But honestly, it, it does contribute to the, oh, it's a fraud. Uh, uh, can yeah. I ask you a no. question then? Um, I won't critique quite yet. Um, what do you think of word print studies that show different authorships? Because there's been, a done, uh, just to define what word print studies are. So word print studies basically analyze different books within a text and they determine whether or not they could have been written by the same author. And I will say both internal within the church obviously mm -hmm. and external outside of the church word print studies show that the authorship is different from varied between the books yes what would you say to that uh the short answer is i don't know okay because that would be a very that would be a very tenuous position to take that to say that someone would be able to write in wildly different styles because word print studies have word print studies have been done on people like shakespeare right and those have been consistently shown that most of his works were probably written and attributed to one person the problem is when you go down the word print study or the, sure. the called the ingrams where you find yeah. uh word tu tuples i think maybe called um so that's a pregnant term different types of word print studies that you can do it's not just tuples but yeah uh i think tuple to be generic it could be two three four but um when you go down that path, there seems to be a very established relationship between the literature of the Book of Mormon and the literature of, you know, contemporary literature of Joseph Smith. So, the, it, it, like the World of 1812, I've heard that used as an example. I don't know how credible that particular claim is. But it, 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 as, a, as a, somebody who's familiar with the Bible, as just as a practical level, when I read the Book of Mormon, I'm like, oh, he just lifted a Petrine phrase and a Pauline phrase, and he's depicting modern Protestant uh, disputes about doctrine and theology as though they were in the sixth century. And, and so Blake Osler, as I understand it, yeah. takes an expansion, expansionist expansion view where he argues that there's an ancient authentic core of the Book of Mormon, uh, you know, describing the Native Americans and what they thought and so forth, but that it was expanded upon by Smith um, to include sort of modern disputes, modern teachings, modern addressing contemporary issues. And I, I think there's a partial truth to that. So I, I don't think there's an ancient core, but I, I, when Osler recognizes that Smith seems to be at least contributing to the Book of Mormon from his contemporary context, I think it's worth noting. So. Yeah, I completely disagree, but what you gotta do? <laughs> I think it's completely ancient, yeah. Um, well, I respect that more than the sort of the progressive view that's like, eh, who cares? Like, um, okay, uh, study Greek. Okay, Greek websites, Bible Vocab app. Um, the, yeah, the Bible Vocab app is awesome, by the yeah, way. Well, yeah, let's just plug the Bible Vocab app and then the Greek websites. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned that you li like to kind of peruse the Greek and that you're going to learn Greek. So what resources do you personally use um, that you find effective for doing that for believers? Uh, Logos Bible Software, also called Logos Bible Software, um, BibleWebApp.com. A really common one among my peers is um, BlueLetterBible.com. Uh, uh, Bible Web App to me is uh, it's more easier to use. Um, and then I'm working on a site called Greek.Theopedia.com. Um, uh, I don't know, what about you? Um, I usually use the Nestle Allen, the, the, the NA28 online edition. I recommend Bible Hub. Bible, oh. Yeah, I like Bible Hub a lot. Blue Letter Bible, I use that sometimes too. Um, I think the best way to do it, though, is to take Smythe. You can get Smythe on PerseusTufts.org. What'd you say? Smythe. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, just take the Greek grammar. Ancient usage of terms? Or? Yeah, so it's a, it's a Greek textbook. It's called Smythe. Just take, it's called a Greek grammar. Just take Smythe. And then sit down with that, sit down with an NA28, and sit down with an interlinear Greek Bible and just piece your way through that. And I think that that's really effective um, to do it that way. Okay, we can wrap this up now. Sounds good. Um, so let's just let's end with this. The, I think there's different modes of communication that are yeah. appropriate to context. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for me, by the way, to do a dialogue with you in the spirit of religious pluralism. Sure. So I, I, would, I would disagree with you if you tried to do that. So to explain that to our watchers, there's a sense in which it's partly true. It's like 
Well, don't you want to learn more about your neighbors? Yes. Don't you want to be a good neighbor with respect to um, sort of virtuous communication? Yeah. Absolutely. Learn, uh, exercise curiosity, um, uh, fairly represent, steel man the positions, flesh them out. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but where I, where I don't want to stop there is um, I'm not a secular uh, atheist. And this isn't like a comparative religious project in the end. I'm an evangelical and I have an agenda and I want to proclaim the truth, I spread the gospel, um, understand my neighbor, and ultimately also refute um, false ideas. Paul uses la language like destroy things that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. So there's a kind of destructive refutation that's cut it at the root. So um, that's where I think the diversity of modes of communication like uh, uh, rebuttal, uh, dialogue, yeah. where you hash things out, uh, different formats of debate, could be done better or worse, um, uh, written debates, um, public calls to repentance, mm -hmm. rebuke. And so for me, I've tried to preach my heart out on the God never sinned issue, for example, is a, is a matter of idolatry and blasphemy and repentance and worship. So anyway, I, I'd like to see the kinds of dialogues that are recognized as just a part of the larger spectrum of communication. Exactly. So. Yeah, because I, I mean, I'm trying to do the same thing that you're doing, but for my faith, and I would say that I am trying to call people to repentance and I'm trying to display truth. And I see what you're doing as basically trying to come to an understanding of what people believe so that way you can take that understanding and preach the gospel more effectively, mm -hmm. which is exactly what I try to do too. Yeah. So it, it's not it's not a matter of agreement. And I, I did see some of the commentators on the last one where they were saying like, oh, it's so great that you could say Kumbaya. And like, I, I do like right. you. I like right, you right, as a person. Right. I respect you as a person. But I very strongly disagree with your religious beliefs right. as you strongly disagree with mine. And the point of this isn't necessarily to be like all, to be like we're both right and we're both like, we're both saying true things. Only one of us is saying true things. And that's the point of- At it. most one. Yeah. At most one, yes. Yeah. And I think we both agree on that. And we both disagree yeah. on it, which one it is. Yeah, when people, when people give compliments about chill dialogues, sure. I get a little nervous sometimes because I'm like, okay, are you, are you, complimenting the virtue of patience I think it'd be good you know yeah, yeah. Or like you know sort of using a contextual opportunity to exercise listening mm -hmm. drawing things out steel manning and fair representation okay I like that but I wonder if a lot of Americans they really like chill religious dialogue because they hate debate they hate uh, repudiation they hate polemics yeah, and, and it's progressive pluralism that's the problem is a lot of the time they see I, 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 I've seen this with what people say about you and also what people say about me when I'm nice to someone. I think once you're nice to someone of a different religion, um, people assume that you must agree with them because a lot of, I think, the religious debates in America where they fail is people will joke around in a rather mean and rude way and they'll put other people down as opposed to being respectful when they debate. So then when you see a respectful dialogue, then you assume that there must be agreement when that agreement doesn't necessarily have to exist. Re respect doesn't equal agreement and I wish people understood that but they often don't yeah I, I and it's my hard for people to put together but I want to do the kind of dialogue that fleshes things out and then I want to go and then construct a declarative call to repentance a, a, a sharp critique um, and I know that can be very personal sometimes because sure. I mean I would call you a false teacher an, in, an enemy of the gospel sure. um, going to hell lest you repent um, I, and, and I don't know a classical Latter-day Saint literature, which sort of draw upon the McConkie, uh, I mean, his description of, <laughs> of evangelicals was no, nothing like, you know, 2020 uh, sort of soft rhetoric. But anyway, don't I, worry, I, yeah. would, I would, yeah. I don't worry, I would say that you're a false teacher yeah. too, like exactly. And I think that that's, that's why I respect you more. I feel like because we both understand that we have to take our religions completely as they are and that our religions completely disagree with each other and that either you're a false teacher or I'm a false teacher and you're going to stand there and say that I am and I'll stand there and say yeah. that you are. That's the point. It's not, the point yeah. is not either one of us is a heretic. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that seems, might seem odd for others. Uh, but so uh, there's this word all in it on this yeah. that I like, and it, there's a professionalism mm -hmm. I think religious opponents can have. And it's not that we're paid to do what we're doing, yeah, but, yeah. but it, there's a kind of decorum that uh, not to misrepresent you. 
uh, not to cut you off uh, inordinately, which I've done that before. I, I apologize with other people's. Uh, I have to, to, to apologize when uh, there's a breakage in basic manners, stuff like that. There's a kind of uh, uh, civility and respect that I think they can be professional in a sense, and yet there's a kind of hearty rebuke, sharp critique um, that is complementary to that. Like, okay, let's hear you out. And then I'm just gonna let it loose. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put, uh, I'm gonna release the fire hose of, of the onslaught of criticism, and, that, and then uphold what I th take to be the, the biblical position. So, although you have the last word. So. Yeah, I totally agree with everything you said. I think that a lot of the time, um, what what I try to do is understand what people are saying, but I'm not trying to understand because I want to agree with you. I think that I'm right and I don't think that I'm the reason why I'm right I think Jesus Christ is the reason why I'm right and that what I'm trying to do is be respectful of you be kind be charitable but also dismantle what I see as an incorrect system which is exactly the thing that you're trying to do so hey stay safe during the COVID season so yeah yeah take care